So, hi guys. Uh, today, our speaker is Professor Samir D. Mathu from the OU State University. He's going to speak about a new approach to quantum cosmology. He was another, uh, he, he had given one talk before for our forum. I forgot which talk, but this is the 98th talk in the series. And uh, we are welcoming uh, Professor Mathu. Uh, to give this talk and thank you very much for this contribution and we are hopeful to learn something, some new aspects in quantum cosmology from you, so you can start. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this uh, nice forum. So I want to share with you some thoughts I have been having about how to think about cosmology from first principles and uh, the uh, my ideas in this have been developing over some years and they are listed in these uh, archive preprints here. So cosmology presents us with many puzzles and here are some of the puzzles and I presume you have all been thinking about these questions off and on. So why is the cosmological constant so small? What gives us the energy which is required to drive inflation? The black hole horizon gives us the entropy of the black hole because we have this idea that the area upon four gives the entropy of the black hole. Now in cosmology, you have the cosmological horizon. So what is the significance of that? Does the area of that measure some entropy? But there is no entropy we see that much which is inside the horizon. So what is it measuring? Then what is the Hubble constant value? Because if you try to measure it from the sky, there seems to be some tension these days the values you get from observation between low redshift objects and from high redshift uh, objects uh, is not quite agreeing. So is there some explanation of that? Uh, and more generally, what is the role of quantum gravity in cosmology? So there are many, many deep questions like this and many others which you might have thought about. And in this talk, we will think about cosmologies from a first principles approach to quantum gravity. And we will find that a new picture emerges for cosmology and that picture has a bearing on all of these questions. So here is the plan of the talk. I'll first talk a little bit about the nature of the cosmological constant. And then I will talk about the quantum gravity equation of state at high energies. Like if you go near the Big Bang, can we say something about the equation of state from first principles? Then we will come to the place which really provides us the most information, the black hole information paradox. And from that, we will see that a new picture emerges for the vacuum of quantum gravity. The whole vacuum structure is different. Uh, we call this the vector hypothesis for the vacuum, and this will be forced upon us from the black hole information paradox. And once we have this new picture of the vacuum, then we will see that it has implications for the observations in cosmology. So as, as we said before, you should of course keep stopping me and asking questions, but this is the plan of the talk. So let's begin with something very simple. If you look at the universe, then let's ask what happens when the universe expands. So we know that in quantum field theory, there are Fourier modes of all scales. And if you try to look at Fourier modes, which have high frequencies, frequency omega going to infinity, then there are some ultraviolet divergences. And if you look at quantum gravity, then these divergences can be particularly bad. So this is the known problem that in quantum gravity, it is difficult to uh, have a renormalization of the theory. So then people might say, okay, let's assume that all the vacuum modes of quantum gravity are cut off at the Planck scale because nothing should really be natural around below the Planck scale due to some quantum gravity effects that we don't know. Okay, so then our picture of the uh, universe will look like this. We make a Planck sized square or cube at each place and there is sort of one degree of freedom in each of these, these cells. Okay, so then what, what happens if the universe expands? So suppose the universe was this big to start with, we can assume the universe is just the shape of a torus, just for convenience. So it is periodically identified. But then if I put a cutoff at Planck length, then I have this many cells in the, in the universe. But when the universe expands and becomes bigger, if I keep the number of degrees of freedom the same, then each cell has become bigger. And now the size of the cell is bigger than Planck length. But that does not satisfy my original idea that the cutoff should be Planck length. So if I keep the cutoff to be Planck length, then the number of degrees of freedom or the number of bits I have kept in my space, well, they will have to increase. So this one looks more logical. If you want to keep a Planck length cutoff, then things should be a little bit like this.
So now suppose we... Samir, I have a question. Yes. So in cosmology, we usually sometimes talk about the co-moving distances. Okay. Yes. So uh, like uh, you were saying that uh, that is not good rather than uh, keeping the Planck uh, length as a cutoff and increasing the number of degrees of freedom, that is good. So in which sense you were saying, could you please explain? A so you can use the co-moving coordinates. That is just a coordinate. Okay. So you can use the co-moving coordinate, but yeah. the question is, where is the cutoff? So the question is, should the cutoff be in the co-moving coordinate or cutoff should be in some fixed thing like Planck length? And the problem is if the cutoff is in the co-moving coordinate, then it doesn't really make that much sense because suppose you start with the time of inflation, then the whole universe was size of one marble and today it is 3000 megaparsec. So whatever was one Planck length at the inflation time is very, very big now. So then the cutoff will be macroscopic today. And we know that is not true. So somehow the cutoff cannot be a fixed amount because when the universe starts from maybe Planck size at the Big Bang and becomes 3000 megaparsec today, today the universe will be, the cutoff will be millions of miles. And that we of course know is not true. Yes. Does that answer what you were asking? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Give me a second. Should, should have yeah. comment. Uh, the point I would like to ask you is that what is the problem with having one degree of freedom in a bigger cell? I'll be able to, I thought the degrees of freedom should remain the same. It doesn't matter whatever the volume of your box is. Yes. So that is exactly the issue I want to point out. In normal quantum mechanics, that's what I was about to say here. Okay. If you can actually increase the, if you keep the cutoff fixed like Planck length, then you can see that the number of degrees of freedom will increase. But so here I write the number uh, of degrees exactly of freedom will increase. At that point. I mean, why should the number of degrees of freedom increase just because the cell area or the cell volume is increasing. Why it is forced that the number of degrees of freedom will be increasing? Expanding inverse, does it say anything to us saying that number of degrees of freedom will be more? So that is, I'm actually trying to point out a puzzle. So let me just finish this slide and come back to your question. Okay. So okay. what is going to happen is we are in some difficulty both sides because if I say the cutoff remains Planck length, then the number of degrees of freedom have to increase. But in normal field theory, the dimension of the Hilbert space remains fixed. Like if you have some initial Hilbert space and some state in that Hilbert space of dimension, let's say 16, then yeah. after some time, the dimension of Hilbert space cannot increase because then in a unitary operation, the dimension of the Hilbert space stays fixed. But yeah. if I do that, it is like the first picture. But then the cutoff is not remaining Planck length. Then how do I have any policy about where I put the cutoff? So basically- but if I put the so Samir, as I understand, basically you are bringing in the how do we define quantum mechanics or what is the working principle for quantum mechanics, which is forcing us, can we increase the degrees of freedom, keeping the dimension of the Hilbert space same, which looks awkward from the quantum mechanics point of view. And, but that's what precisely we are being forced to open how to remove that puzzle. Is this the point you are driving at? Yes, that is the point I'm driving at. How do we think about cutoff? People say that we should put cutoff at Planck length, but it is not so simple. Yeah, You have yeah. to worry about the issue. Yeah. So I'm just trying to point out that there is some difficulty in thinking about either way you think there is some problem. Okay. So, so we can see that in normal field theory, we cannot increase the dimension of Hilbert space, but in a theory which includes gravity, uh, it can be okay. Because then you can say the Hilbert space is the union of all these possibilities. There are, there's a universe with 16 bits, there's a universe with uh, 25 bits and all this and all these possible uh, spaces with different number of bits. The union of them, you can say is the Hilbert space. And then you can say the evolution goes from here to here. If you uh -huh. put some cutoff, okay, you have no choice but to say something like that. I mean, sorry, uh, why is gravity being chosen? I Means I could have put in field theory, we put cutoff and various times like lattice putting field theory in lattice, the similar question will come into picture. And the gravity theory, why is it being chosen that this is the problem with gravity theory? I thought that, let's say that even you are working in some, <clears throat> any other weak, 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 uh, weak interaction. And if I increase or decrease the energy in some scale, the same problem will face about the Hilbert space dimension changing. Degree of freedom changing. 
because at the end so if you increase the energy i don't see the issue like suppose you have normal no. field theory in a box yeah then the size yeah. of the box will not change no but right? the point i am i am trying to understand is that how is gravity because you, gravity is a unique interaction looking from the interaction point of view what is extra thing in the gravity that this is forcing us this problem mm -hmm. which is extra extra thing is that in gravity the space the metric can change okay. because when the it's, metric changes the space point. expands yeah. All other interaction is not caring about space time. Now yeah. gravity is the thing because matter creates gravity. Anything happens to the matter if degrees of freedom increases. That's why that is what you are trying to say about gravity, basically. Yes. So it is going to increase the size of space time. But the yeah. point is, if you don't put cutoff at Planck length, then people say, how will we get the value of cosmological constant? Then it will be infinity. But they say it should be Planck scale because it is cut off at Planck length. But if uh -huh. you want to put some cutoff like Planck length, but the space time expands, then uh -huh. what will happen? Either the number of degrees of freedom have to increase, or uh -huh. the cutoff will not be Planck length. Okay. If the so cutoff maybe, is not Planck length, then you have no policy to put the cutoff. Yes. No. It's uh, okay. The same thing I can ask also. Uh, yeah, it's a bad thing that our predecessors have taught us how to do quantum mechanics or quantum field theory. But always they have assumed that Minkowski and space time or when they say curved space time, the expansion of that curved space time has never been taken. So, if I want to do the same theories, even even electrodynamics, in yes. a in an expanding in an expanding manifold, let's not talk about yes. universe in an expanding manifold, yes. which not remains fixed, we'll face the same problem. Yes, of course. It's so expanding manifold means some gravity, right? Because the metric is changing. No, there's something yeah, it doesn't require quantum gravity. The yes. quantum gravity only comes because you try to put some cutoff at Planck length. If you don't bring quantum gravity, then Planck length is not there. That's right. I agree. The Planck length is coming from quantum gravity. But even if I do perturbation theory of quantum electrodynamics on a manifold or on a space time, not a fixed space time, but it itself is expanding, we'll have the same problem. Am I right or not? You have the same problem. You will have the same problem of how many degrees of freedom you want. But That's then you would not have any cutoff anyway because you don't have any notion of Planck length if G is not available. Yeah, but for example, we have to fabricate other other, other lengths possibly. I don't know what is there, but uh, maybe a dynamical Planck length. Okay, so okay, so I don't know Planck what to say. The Planck length itself changes on times, something like that. Okay, but I don't have anything useful to say about that. Okay. Uh, Let's yeah. go. Okay. So anyway, let us see what the problem is. So Einstein's equations of uh, gravity look like this, and here lambda is the cosmological constant. And so now let us see how we get the value of lambda, because people say that if you just add up all the vacuum energy of all the degrees of freedom, you will get lambda going to infinity. If you put cutoff at Planck length, then lambda becomes Planck scale. And so people say, okay, so normally the value of lambda you expect to be Planck scale. The value of lambda you observe in the sky is very small, so that is the puzzle. But the point is there are puzzles even before that, and that's what I want to right now mention. And this really, this work has been, this kind of things have been discussed by many people before, and I have listed some names down here. So what is the cosmological constant? If you look from this equation, if you move the lambda to the right, you can see it acts like a stress tensor with p equals minus rho. Okay, so that's what a cosmological constant is the pressure should be equal to minus the energy density. So if you look at the vacuum fluctuations from quantum fields, people say that if you cut them off at the Planck length, it will give you a lambda, which is like Planck length to the minus four. But let us look at this a little more carefully because even though the statement is made very often, uh, it is not so uh, easy to see how this will come about. So for simplicity, just look at a scalar field in one plus one dimensions. So here the, action, the Lagrangian is d mu phi d mu phi. And if you compute a stress tensor from that, uh, here is the standard stress tensor. And from there, you can compute the rho and the p. The rho is the TT component of the stress tensor, and the pressure is the XX component of the stress tensor, and here they are both. But if you look at this, you see something funny. Uh, they are actually giving you p equal to rho. They are not giving you p equal to minus rho. So how are we going to get p equal to minus rho by looking at the vacuum fluctuations of the scalar field in one plus one dimensions. Well, anyway, right now we have not looked at the vacuum fluctuations and the cutoffs and so on. So let's look at the whole thing more 
carefully and see if we can we get p equal to rho or we get p equal to minus rho. So we take the scalar field and we expand it in terms of oscillators in the normal way. It's a free field and I'm in one plus one dimension. So there is my expansion. And the space, let me compactify it to a circle of length L. So everything is you know, compact and nice. Then these Fourier frequencies Kn are two pi N upon L and N is an integer. And the, because the master's field, the frequency of the mode omega N is just mod K. Standard scalar field quantization. So then if you compute the energy density uh, rho, which is the ex vacuum expression value of T sub TT, uh, in the usual way, you end up uh, summing over all the Fourier modes. And when you add up all the Fourier modes, you will find that you, you end up getting this answer. And so as you keep increasing the uh, uh, N max, the cutoff, of course, the energy increases, but you compute the pressure P and you get the same answer. And that is not surprising because we said T sub TT is equal to T sub XX. So you still get rho equals p. Uh, you have put the cutoff, but you're not getting rho equal to minus p. So how do we say that the vacuum fluctuations give us like a cosmological constant? So let us to see what is actually going on. Let us derive the pressure in a different way. If you have the energy in some box, then the basic thermodynamic relation is del E by del L, like change the length of the box with a minus sign, that is the pressure because you know, the, the pressure times the distance, it gives the work. So the energy changes pressure times change in distance. So this is a standard expression for pressure in terms of energy. The energy in the box, you can write as energy density times the length of the box because we are only in one dimension. So then if I do that, my expression for rho I take from the previous slide, that had a one by L squared. If I multiply by L, it has a one by L. I do the minus D by DL and I get this. And if you look at the previous slide, you see this is actually rho. So not the same thing as what we had before, I'm still getting P equals rho. So now we have to put in the value of N max. What is N max? If my box size is L and my cutoff is L plank, then N max is L upon L plank. So I put in that value, then I'll get something which goes like the Planck scale. So that at least is true. You get the Planck scale physics if you put cutoff at Planck scale, but you get P equals rho, not P equals minus rho. Okay, so we are still there. And if you do the same thing for three plus one dimensions, you get P equals one third row. It's the correct scale, the Planck scale, but it's not P equals minus row. And why do you get one third row? Well, whenever you start with a massless field, you get a traceless tensor. And if P is equal to one third row, that's the, that's the traceless condition. Okay, so we still don't have P equals minus row. So why do people say that the vacuum fluctuations will produce a cosmological constant? Samir, Samir I just, yeah. have you, are you considering this city Euclidean one plus one dimension? Or it is so this is right now everything is Lorentzian because our world is Lorentzian. Uh, but right now it doesn't make much difference because I'm just looking at the state at a given time and just the usual condensation of the state and the vacuum state. If you're not evolving the state, it doesn't matter whether you're evolving in Euclidean time or Lorentzian time. Okay, okay, let's go ahead. This will be the same. So let's see, give this. So what we should actually be doing is that we should be setting the cutoff in a different way. So we talked about this a short while ago. We should set the cutoff in a different way. We have to do a del by del L or in more dimensions D by DV to get the pressure. But when I increase L, I have to ask myself if the L becomes bigger, do I put more squares in it or the same number of squares? Well, if we are putting the cutoff at Planck length, then we had seen that we should put more squares. Okay, so I'm going to put more squares in there and then let us see what happens. So then if I look at this row, it's the same calculation as before, but what value of n max should I put? The value of n max should not be some fixed number in my mind, but it should depend on L. So it is equal to n upon L plank. And so the energy, total energy is then of course that times L. And now if I do this, my n max, not a number I fixed once, but I, instead of n max, I use L. So the, when the length changes, I'm actually going to increase the number of degrees of freedom. My n max will actually increase. I will have more Fourier modes in there. If I take that and I compute minus DE by DL, this time I find P equals minus rho. So finally, I do manage to get the cosmological constant, but the physical way in which I did, and also in three plus one dimensions, I do that, I get P equals minus rho. And then you get a thing which looks like lambda because P is minus rho. And the scale, of course, is again, the Planck scale, which is of course far too large, but at least what we have seen so far is that to get a, just the form of the cosmological constant with p equals minus rho, you already have to realize that if you put a cutoff at Planck length, 
then when you take the pressure, you have to compute by assuming that when the universe expands, the number of Planck cells also increase. Okay, that may not be unreasonable, but at least we have learned something. But now we are stuck at the problem that the value of lambda is too large. So now what do you do? So people sometimes use dimensional regularization to get the vacuum energy. And if you use dimensional regularization of the theory of some scalar field, let us say, then you get P equals minus rho automatically because everything is covariant. So it will automatically be proportional to eta mu nu. But the answer is very counterintuitive. Your cutoff scale is something like capital M, that's some UV cutoff. But the mass of the scalar field comes here. So if you had a master scalar field, you actually get zero. Now that doesn't agree with our normal intuition that the vacuum fluctuations of Fourier modes uh, is giving the vacuum energy and that's going to give the cosmological constant. For massless field, you actually get zero. If you have a scalar field with a positive, with a normal mass, the energy density of rho you get from the dimensional regulation is actually negative, not even positive. For fermionic field, it is actually negative. And so it's not even clear what all this number means. It still depends on the UV cutoff, which you cannot put equal to the Planck scale. So what happens is if you do it by dimensional regulation, you can get some number, but the number has no direct physical meaning for us because we have already seen that there are a lot of physical issues involved in understanding how the ultraviolet theory is giving a cosmological constant, but this is just some mathematical thing which is giving some answer and it's not even clear that answers anything to do with the idea that vacuum fluctuations cost energy. And even the sign is opposite for a scalar field. So then people said, let's try something like supersymmetry because then the energy of both of the fermions can cancel, the divergences cancel, maybe that's good. But then Susie is broken at the TeV scale or higher from observations today. And then you will get a vacuum uh, energy, which is of the order of the TeV scale, which is certainly not what we see. Okay, so that's also not working very well. Then in string theory, people try models like the KKLT model and so on to get cosmological constants, but they normally end you up in anthropic arguments and even that model people have argued is actually not consistent anyway. So uh, things have not been working very well with these kinds of attempts also. So all I'm saying right now with all this is that there is no clear understanding of the cosmical constant along the lines of it being the vacuum energy of quantum fields. So we don't actually understand what sets the uh, zero of the vacuum energy. So what we will actually argue is that there's a completely different picture of the vacuum of quantum gravity. It does not have that much to do with what is happening at the Planck scale. So normally one thinks that all the issues of quantum gravity happen at the Planck scale. So a picture of the vacuum is like this. At very long distances, you just have normal quantum fields in flat space or gently curved space and gravity is classical. And only if you look inside the Planck length, then you start seeing all this mess of quantum gravity. Okay? This is the conventional picture. But we are going to argue this is not the correct picture. The quantum gravity vacuum has a very different structure. The vacuum has virtual fluctuations of black holes of all kinds of sizes. So you know there are black holes of all sizes in the world, but if there can be a black hole in real life, there can also be a virtual fluctuation which describes a black hole. Just like if there can be electrons and positrons, there can also be virtual fluctuations of electrons and positrons. So they are all part of the vacuum and we have to think of them when we think of the structure of the vacuum. So just because we can have black holes of all sizes, we can also have virtual fluctuations of black holes of all sizes. And then you might think, okay, that may be true in principle, but in practice, if you think of the virtual fluctuation of a black hole, which is very big, very much bigger than Planck size, maybe one kilometer in radius, then such a fluctuation will be very unlikely because this uh, object is very heavy. But what we will see is that uh, even though the fluctuation to any one black hole microstate is highly suppressed because such a massive object, the entropy of black holes is given by the area upon G, and it's a very big number. We have always known the Bekestan entropy of a black hole is very, very big, but we never knew what to do with that number. But now we see it has a direct significance because suppose you take a very big black hole, we're talking of a large mass, then it has a very large number of possible states. And the probability of fluctuating to any one of those states is very small. But if you multiply by the number of possible states you can fluctuate to, then you find the probability is order one. So once you take that into account, we will see that the fluctuations of even large virtual black holes are not suppressed. So the quantum gravity vacuum has these kinds of fluctuations around every point and fluctuations with every possible radius. And this is what dominates the nature of the vacuum for quantum gravity. So once you have this, then you will see that the, all the issues true with what is the cosmological constant, what drives the energy of the vacuum, they all come from a different source. They're not actually coming from the small scale of what is happening at the Planck length, where as we have seen, there is no good uh, solution to the puzzle, even though people have been staring at it 
for a long time, we will see the energy comes of the cosmology is dominated by understanding the structure of the vacuum at these large scales. So right now I haven't told you anything about it or why we are doing this. Right now we are just saying that this is where we are headed and we have just sort of gotten some motivation to where we are going. Okay. So let me just go to the next part of the talk, which is what do we see the, as we go towards the Big Bang? So take some definite theory of quantum gravity, let's say string theory, and let's ask a very definite question. What is the equation of state in the limit of energy density being infinite? So what does that mean? Like suppose you take a box with some volume V and you put in that some energy E. The equation of state means the following. What is the entropy S if you have that box and with energy E and volume V? So that depends on what you put in the box, but the value of S as a function of E and V is called the equation of state. So if you go to this, to the Big Bang, Let's say at some point you had radiation. So then you know the equation of state for radiation. What is the entropy in terms of the energy? Uh, at uh, earlier times than that, maybe you had string gas. So there also you know the equation of state is some kind of hagedorn. Maybe before that you had a brain gas. So people have studied equation of state for that. It's also some kind of hagedorn. But as you go closer and closer to the Big Bang, it will be all kinds of, uh, all the degrees of string, uh, string theory will be, degrees of freedom of string theory will be excited. And you can ask, what is the equation of state in that limit? So it looks like a well-posed question. If you already know your theory of quantum gravity and you suppose you assume it is string theory, there should be an answer to the question, what is S as a function of E and V? And we will see that there seems to be a definite answer to this question. And the answer is that S should be up to a factor of order one, which we are not writing here, up to a constant of order one, it should be square root of EV upon G. So I will give you the arguments for this before. It has appeared several times in the literature, but there's also a problem. If you take this equation of state and you put it in the evolution equation of cosmology, you find an evolution equation with a scale factor expands as t to the power one third. But that doesn't correspond to anything that we have seen in observations, because in the world we sometimes see t to the half, that's the radiation phase. We see uh, t to the two thirds, that's the dust phase, but we have never seen t to the one third. Now it's possible that that happens very close to the Big Bang and is then washed out because of inflation, so we don't actually see it. But anyway, we don't have any evidence to for this t to the one third. And uh, we also see that when you get into this phase, it's very difficult to get out of this phase. So you can start puzzling, why are we not seeing this phase t to the one third? Because this seems to be the unique equation of state that you get at high energies from any theory of quantum gravity, okay? But we will see that this conflict that we are being forced into this particular equation of state and we're not seeing this equation of state, it will actually be resolved once we come back to this picture of the gravitational vacuum, that there is structure of these virtual black holes at all sizes. This will actually come back and resolve our puzzle. So we're not actually talking anything about this structure right now. We're just trying to right now understand how do you get this equation of state and how does it give this particular expansion? This is a very basic part of cosmology, which hasn't been focused on very much by people. And I just want to bring it to your attention. So let us talk about this issue from first principles. And this was the question. Suppose you take a box and you put some energy in that box. Suppose you just put radiation. Then you know the equation of state is that the entropy goes like e to the power three quarter. Okay. So we know we put more and more energy and the entropy increases like e to the three quarter. Then if you put even more energy in the box, you want to get even more entropy. How will you get that? Then people say, okay, let's make a black hole in there. A black hole has, uh, is very dense in terms of energy. It has a lot of entropy. So maybe that way I can put more entropy in my box. The volume of the box is fixed. It is some value V. So then I, if you make a bigger uh, black hole, then you can get more entropy. So you can say, I can get put this much entropy in the box and has some energy, which is the energy of the black hole. But let us keep asking, can I put even more entropy in the box? So at first you would think I can't put any more entropy in the box because a black hole has the most entropy and this is the biggest black hole that can fit in the box. So how can I put more entropy in the box? But it's an easy way to see that you can put actually much more entropy in the box. So instead of putting one black hole in the box, which has some energy E1 and the entropy of that, let's say call it S1, it's the area upon four for this uh, black hole. Instead of putting one black hole, let us put lots of different black holes. So it's a lattice of black holes. So imagine putting all these different black holes and the total energy of this might be something else. Let's call it E2 and the total entropy of this will be some S2. But you can see the entropy now is actually more. So how do you see it is more? You can see it is more from the following argument. 
the area of this is roughly the area of the walls of this box, right? Apart from a factor of some four pi by three or something, it's the same area as four factor of four pi. It's like the same as the area of the box. Let's forget the factor of order unit. But now if you look at the area of all these black holes and you add them to get the new entropy S2, the area of this black hole is given by the area of this box, area of this black hole is given by the area of this box and so on. So I have to take the area of all these boxes. But now you see the outside walls of these boxes, this wall, this wall, this wall, this wall, it already makes up the area of the old box. And then I extra get the area of all these walls of the box. You see all these areas are extra. So there's much more area in all these uh, boxes than there was in just the outer box. So the, if I add up the areas of all these black holes, it's going to be more than the area of this. So now you can see I put much more entropy in the box. So at first, this may look surprising to you because you have some belief at the back of the mind. Many people have this belief that one black hole sort of uh, gives a maximum possible entropy. But now we are finding if you break the black hole into many black holes, it actually has more entropy. So what goes wrong with our original intuition that a black hole has the most entropy, single black hole? And the answer is if you actually compute the energy of all these black holes, you'll find the energy is much more than the energy of a single black hole. So what the intuition we have that one black hole maximizes the entropy is actually coming from a slightly different setting. If you actually say that my energy is given, some fixed energy, then the maximum entropy you can get by making it into one big black hole. If you, on the other hand, say my volume is fixed, but the energy is not fixed. You can put whatever energy you want. Then actually the entropy is maximized by taking many, many different black holes. Okay, So it's still true that if I take all these black holes and I merge them into one big black hole, then the entropy will be even more. But then what will happen is the volume will be much bigger. It will not fit in my box. So anyway, what we are interested right now is if you fix the volume and then I keep increasing the energy, then how much entropy can I fit? And in that situation, you can see taking many black holes has more entropy than taking one black hole. Why is this thing relevant? Because in cosmology, what happens is that the volume is sort of fixed. At a given time, I have some volume in my universe. Just assume the universe is, let's say, like a torus. Then at that time, I can maximize the entropy by putting lots of different black holes, just the way that we have seen. And then you will say, OK, why don't they merge into one black hole and become bigger? Because that has even more entropy. Well, the universe will have to expand to do that, but it can expand only at some rate. It cannot immediately expand. The expansion rate is actually fixed by Einstein's equations. So the volume of the universe at a given time is sort of fixed. It can't immediately expand. Of course, over time, it will expand by the Einstein equations. And when it expands, the black holes will merge into bigger black holes, and the evolution will thereby go on. This thing is what is called the black hole gas. It has been studied by many people whose names I had listed before. And then let's ask, what is the equation of state of this black hole gas? To do that, all the things we said in words before, let's now do it with numbers and see what we get. And so with numbers, the thing looks like as follows. So here we have our lattice of black holes. Let's take the, the box that we have in which we want to compute the entropy. Let the box have a volume V. Let's suppose we are putting in the energy in the box equal to E and the radius of each black hole is R. Calculation is very simple. Then the number of black holes in the box will be of order the volume of the box upon the volume of each black hole, that's like R cube. So that's the number of holes in the box. Entropy of each hole is the area of the hole, which is like R square upon G. It's the 4G, but we are not looking at factors like four. So total entropy in the box is number of holes times the entropy of each hole. If I multiply that, I get this. The energy of each hole is R upon G. Where do I get that from? The radius of the black hole is two GM. We don't care about the factor of two. So G times M, M is the mass of the hole, which is the energy of the hole. So that is the R. So energy of the hole is R upon G. That's the R equals uh, two GM uh, equation. And so the total energy in the box is the number of holes in the box times the energy of each hole. And that's given by this equation. Okay, so if you just make a lattice of black holes of radius R each, everything is clear here. And if you look at this, you find the entropy in the box in terms of the E and the V satisfies this equation. Okay, so that's the equation of state that we were talking about. It comes from black holes. So if you think black holes have the most entropy, good, we are using the black holes. And then we have also said that many black holes, the lattice of black holes has more entropy than a single black hole. We have done all that. And then with all that, we have found this equation of state. And interestingly, if you notice that the energy density is E upon V, then you find that you can write the entropy as rho, root rho upon G times V. 
So you can see that uh, this is the e, e, the if I write in terms of rho, then I get two powers of b. If I take them out of the square root, and there you see the entropy is actually extensive. It's proportional to the volume. So people often say that in gravity, the entropy is proportional to the area, like surface area, because the black hole entropy comes from the surface area. But that is not actually true. The actual entropy in a box is maximized by a lattice of black holes. And the lattice of black holes actually gives the entropy as proportional to the volume. It is extensive, proportional to the volume, like all other entropies in the world are extensive. This is also extensive. And even though I worked here for three plus one dimensions, you can do this in any number of dimensions and you actually get the same expression. So it's a rather beautiful and universal answer. You get the same expression. So then if you go to string theory and you say, what, do, what should I take as the equation of state over here? Then the natural conjecture would be that uh, the uh, answer for the entropy should look like this, but because it's extensive, I can write terms of entropy density, little s is s upon capital V. And so you get this, ex this equation. Let's put the a constant k of order unity to make it an equality, just some number of order unity, and then uh, s equals k root rho over g. So this looks like a very universal equation of state that you get if you try to use the idea of black holes having a lot of entropy. Interestingly, the same equation of state comes also in a different way. So far, we have not used any string theory. But suppose you start using string theory, you can ask the question in a different way. Our question remains the same. Take a box of volume V. In the box, you put some energy E. And the question was, what is the entropy in the limit E going to infinity? But now we are going to put two conditions. First of all, if you have string theory, then in string theory, you, know, have, you have S dualities and T dualities. What is the T duality? T duality says that the length of any of the cycles of this torus can be changed to one over L. So the length is L. It, if you, I make it one over L, the theory is invariant. If everything is invariant, the entropy should be invariant. Right? So it should be invariant under all T dualities. And S duality says if the coupling constant G is taken to one over G, then uh, again, everything should be invariant. It's a symmetry of the theory. So the entropy cannot change under that also. So whatever expression I get for the entropy in string theory should be invariant under S dualities and T duality. I'm looking for S as a function of E and V, but right now suppose this is all that I tell you. I only have one other condition. When the energy becomes comparable to the energy of a black hole in the box, then we have already seen that one black hole sort of maximizes the entropy. At that time, the entropy should become like the area of the box upon G. Okay. So it, I'm of course going to put much more entropy in the box. That's when it becomes the lattice of black holes kind of thing and so on. Right now, I'm not using the lattice of black holes picture. I'm simply requiring dualities, but also requiring that when the energy is just enough to fit one black hole, then at least it should be equal to the entropy of a black hole. If we just put these conditions, you find the only equation of state that works is again the equation of state we already derived from the black hole picture. S goes like root EV over G. So this is amazing. A completely different argument using S and T dualities forces exactly the same equation of state. So it looks very likely that in string theory now, we have the following picture. If you have a lattice of, if you have put enough uh, energy density in some region so that the entropy in that is maximized. Uh, so you have, first we said you have radiation, it has some entropy, you put more energy in the box, you can make it a black hole, put more energy in the black hole because as big as the box. You put even more energy, where do you go? Well, the picture is a lattice of black holes, whether that picture is good for you or not, the equation for the entropy in that domain where the energy density becomes more than the energy density of putting one black hole all the way up to the Planck energy density, the equation of state has to be this by duality. So that's amazing. All this suggests that we do know the equation of state in near the Big Bang. And so we should take that equation of state and we should plug it into Einstein's equations and see what we get. Well, to put into Einstein's equations, we need to know the uh, stress tensor. And to get the stress tensor, so far we only have the S, but we need the pressure because the stress tensor also has the pressure that you can get from the thermodynamics because TDS is DE plus PDV. Then you get the tensor, the uh, temperature from DS by DE at constant V and you get some expression for that. Then you get the pressure also as DS by, this was DS DE, this is DS DV. So you find P and you find that P actually becomes equal to rho. So in fact, you find that this equation of state you get for this phase is P equals, if you write a W rho, which is the standard way of writing it, you get W equals one. This is what is called a stiffest equation of state uh, compatible with reasonable physics because the speed of the sound in this situation is equal to the speed of light. So it's a very robust equation of state 
It is a very standard equation of state, which is called the stiffest equation of state. It has p equals rho. It's all forced upon you by string theory at high energy densities. Okay, so let's take this equation of state and put it in the cosmological evolution. So you write your cosmology as minus dt squared plus the usual way we write the flat cosmology. I'm not even making all the different sides the same. I, it's homogeneous. It doesn't have to be isotropic. I write out the Einstein's equations. I put the answer, they expand like a power law. The usual way we solve Einstein's equations for the cosmology, and then you get some solution. And here's the solution then. And of course, now I will just specialize it to the isotropic one. If you specialize to the isotropic expansion, with that, you find the scale factor goes as t to the power one. Okay, and this is the puzzle I was pointing to because we do not have any evidence for the t to the one third from uh, actually from the unit from the observations in the sky. So what could go wrong with this logic? The so, equation of state we have is so universal. Yes, I, question. So in three plus one dimension, you said that the scale factor goes as t to the power one third. So in general, the dimension is it like one by d t to the power yes. one? Yes, it's exactly one over the number of space dimensions. Okay, so let's see if something could be wrong with this logic because this logic is so universal, it seems that the early universe should always be in this phase. But now we will see that, so what is, could be the flaw in this logic? So we have started by computing this entropy by asking for a volume V and put some energy E in that. But if you take some volume V and some energy E and you put in the equation of state, then it'll, there'll always be some Hubble expansion because the A dot over A square is given by the energy density in the box. So if you have some energy density, the box size actually cannot stay fixed. The box will always be expanding. So shouldn't we always be thinking about expanding boxes? Now that was true even for the radiation phase. If you have some radiation in the universe, there will be some expansion at the rate of t to the half. So we, why are we using equilibrium thermodynamics and the standard answer entropy goes like e to the three quarters. We use that in all our studies of the early universe, but why are we using that? Because the thing is not in equilibrium. Well, the reason was very simple. The expansion time, which is Hubble constant inverse, uh, is very long. Okay, it could be several seconds, but the radiation wavelength is very small. So because if we are high temperature, the radiation wavelength is much smaller than the Hubble radius. And so the fact it expands over the scale of the Hubble radius, uh, that's completely irrelevant. At any given time, you can still talk about equilibrium. So that's why even though if you have energy density in a box, the box must be expanding, but, uh, but we don't have to worry about it. But in our situation now with the black hole gas, comparable to the Hubble scale, which we have used in the argument, uh, so that we have to this time worry about the fact it is not in equilibrium. Well, in flat space, we said we have these virtual black holes fluctuations of all sizes. So in particular, if they can be bigger and bigger and bigger, they can be of arbitrarily big sizes, but we're actually going to see very soon that in a cosmology, they cannot be of arbitrary size. The radius of these fluctuations can be between zero and the Hubble scale. Okay, so the biggest bubbles you find are of the Hubble scale, and then there are bubbles which are not bigger than that. You can't have bigger bubbles than that. We will see that. But now that you have these structures in the vacuum, which are of the order of the cosmological scale, now you have to worry about the argument. Because if the expansion on the scale of the uh, Hubble, Hubble radius, that's the time it takes. But there are structures on the size of the Hubble scale, which are important to understanding the vacuum. I can no longer assume that I should start with a box of fixed volume B and fixed energy E and compute the equation of state. So that's how the, the argument that you must have the t to the one over three expansion rate uh, is not forced upon us. So it allows us to get out of this uh, conflict with observations that we don't see the t to the one third in the sky. Okay, so all this is very rough and we, we haven't said anything about why we must have this picture of virtual black holes. I'm just right now trying to just build up about the kind of things we should be thinking about when we think about uh, quantum cosmology, because all these are the basic ways of thinking about quantum gravity and quantum cosmology that I wish more people would focus on. These are the difficulties and the puzzles that we face when we start from first principles. So I will now move over to explaining why this picture is actually correct. And that picture comes to us from the black hole information paradox. In that we have used work of many, many people who have contributed to the whole fuzzball program. And I have listed some of their names here. Sorry. Uh, yes. You, you have mentioned that the size of the fluctuation is like maximum size is Hubble inverse. Okay. Yes. So now the thing is, we know that this Hubble parameter itself time dependent. Okay. Yes. Now, now the thing is, 
uh, if I can able because you know that the, all the Hubble parameter people are measuring these days at the present time scale, at the late yes. time. Yeah. Yes. So from this idea, the measuring uh, the Hubble constant at the late time, can I able to uh, collect some idea about this size of this fluctuation? So this, when I say Hubble time scale, you have to look at the universe at every given time. And this H is the Hubble constant at that time. So the yeah. vacuum structure is actually changing with time. And when the Hubble constant was very small, the Hubble radius was very small. Then the bubbles you had, had all sizes from the Planck radius up to the that Hubble radius. But then at later time, the vacuum relaxes in a way where there are bubbles of these, these virtual black holes of even bigger radii. So in fact, that evolution will give us all the interesting effects in cosmology that we are looking for. So that evolution is what we are going to focus on. Yes. Okay. Exactly. It's not a fixed number. It's going to change. And that will tell us. Uh... So, so far we have been talking about cosmology, but we are now going to take a little bit of diversion and talk about the black hole information paradox, because in trying to resolve this paradox, we'll get to this picture where these virtual fluctuations come. And the only input we will use to getting to this picture of these virtual bubbles is that in the full quantum gravity theory, we should have causality to leading order. So you can see that's a very weak requirement. And I'm sure most of you would like to accept that. And what does that mean? It means that in any region of space-time where the curvature is much lower than the Planck scale of curvature, like in the galaxy today, then any effect that violate causality, that means they go outside the light cone, for low energy physics, they must be small. So low energy physics means like physics in the lab from you know millimeters, centimeters, meters, kilometers, that scale. For low energy wavelengths, so long wavelengths, all effects at that scale to leading order are satisfy causality if the curvature is weak. So I'm sure if you would agree that is completely natural with only that assumption and the black hole information paradox, we will see we are forced into this picture of the vacuum that I mentioned. And then from this picture of the vacuum, we will then see that we get interesting uh, inputs into all the puzzles in uh, cosmology today, like you know where could we get dark energy from, where could we get inflation energy from, and things like that. So that's uh, where we are going. So let's go and talk about the black hole information paradox. For those who may not be familiar, I'll just start from first principles for a little while. So any mass has some intrinsic energy, like E equals mc squared, which is positive. But because gravity is attractive, if you place this mass near some other heavy mass, capital M, then there's a potential energy minus gmm over r, which is negative. So if you want to write the total energy of this mass little m, when it is placed near this mass big M, then the intrinsic energy is mc squared, but then there's also the negative contribution. So that's the total value. So then if you have this expression, you see that the total energy of this little m actually become negative if r is less than a certain value. You can just put in this expression and see when it become negative. For r less than that, this energy is negative. Of course, because we are talking of gravity, we should be doing general relativity, but you can do this all with general relativity and you see that it doesn't change the argument very much. You only get extra factor of two. Within this radius, which you recognize as the horizon radius for a black hole, for a mass M, inside this region, the net energy of a particle can be negative, which basically means that the MC square intrinsic energy can be more than compensated by the negative gravitational potential uh, of that object. So the vacuum of, uh, of around the horizon is then unstable to the creation of particle pairs, because now you can make a vacuum fluctuation whose total energy is zero. In here, you can have something with negative energy. In here, you can have something of positive energy, and then the total energy is zero. So you can obviously have fluctuation, which goes from your initial state with no particle pair to the state with one particle pair. Then the outside member has positive energy, so it can drift off to infinity, uh, and that's what is Hawking radiation. And the inside member had negative energy, so it reduces the mass of the black hole, and the black hole becomes a little smaller. So this is the process of Hawking radiation. But the important thing is the two members of this pair are produced in an entangled state because suppose this is electron, this is positron. You can also produce it other way around, but this is positron, this is electron. So the actual quantum fluctuation is produced in a linear superposition. So what is outside doesn't have a definite uh, sign. If this is positron, this is electron. If this is electron, this is positron. So this is what is called entanglement. You can also talk about the entanglement of spin. If this guy has spin up, this has spin down. If this spin down, this is spin up. They make a singlet. So this is the usual way we see about entanglement in quantum mechanics. Nothing unusual about that. The electron in a singlet, if you look at one electron in a singlet pair, uh, it doesn't have a definite spin state. The spin state of the electron is up if the other guy is down. It is down if the other guy is up. In the total state, the superposition, up, down, minus, down, up. 
So the important thing is the uh, pair production, the radiation which is produced by Hawking evaporation is in an entangled state with the uh, radiation quantum which is left behind. So then the state, whenever, to, uh, whenever the entire state of a system is written as a sum of products, let's say up times down, minus down times up, you've added two states together, up, down, and down, up. If you have n such states added together in that set, then you say the entanglement between the two uh, electrons or whatever you have is log of the number of terms coming in the sum. So if you have one pair, you can say it has, let's say, log two amounts of entanglement. If you produce n different pairs because the addition keeps happening, then you produce n times log two worth of entanglement. So as you keep radiating more and more pairs from the hole, uh, as the emission steps n increase, the entanglement between the radiation and the remaining hole, that actually keeps increasing. So this is the graph, sometimes called the page curve. And so this is the uh, entanglement graph. So this leads to a puzzle at the end point of evaporation, because what happens when the black hole completely evaporates away? So Hawking in 1975 said, well, the black hole completely disappears. Yes, I mean, the radiation. I, yes, there's some question. When you have said that it's a n log two, this uh, why this two factor appears? So the log two is only a toy model because I said I'm taking something with only the uh, let's say electron positron and positive positron. If I just have two states, then you, I have only two terms in the sum, and I get log two. Oh. If you also include the sum spin, it could be log four. If yes. you only have photon, then there's no charge, it's again log two. So it's log two is not important. It's some number of order unity. And that's a very good question. It the only important thing in this graph is it decreases linearly with n. Yes. So if the black hole evaporates away completely, then you're left with this radiation, but the radiation is now heavily entangled. It was entangled till the black hole evaporated. It has all this entanglement n log two, but now what it is entangled with is no longer there. So that's a big problem because if there's nothing wrong with one electron being entangled with another electron, which is very far away. You can have a state up, down, minus, down, up. But if the other electron disappears from the universe, then it's a serious problem because the first electron has no state at all. It can't be up because it's up if the other guy was down, but the other guy is not there. It can't be down because it was down only if the other guy was up. So the other guy is not there. This guy doesn't have any well-defined quantum state. And that was what is called the breakdown of quantum mechanics. So Hawking said that, uh, you know, when a black hole forms and evaporates, you uh, lose the unitarity of quantum mechanics because you start with a star, which is a well-defined state. Then you make a black hole, then you make pair production. In the end, you only have the radiation, but in the radiation, you don't have a well-defined state. So you start with a well-defined initial state, normal physics, you'll have some unitary evolution. You will get some well-defined final state, but now that is not happening. So Hawking said, quantum mechanics breaks down when you have black holes and that's the black hole information paradox. So people are very worried about this. They don't want to lose quantum mechanics. So they said, well, maybe when the black hole gets down to Planck size, the evaporation stops because of some quantum gravity effect, which we don't know. But then there's a heavy amount of entanglement between the remnant, well, what remains here is called the remnant, and the radiation, this n log two amount of entanglement, which means the remnant must have a large number of states. Obviously, it has many states because all these different electrons are in there. Some have spin up, some have spin down. So there are, if there are n electrons, there are two to the n possible states in here. But then the question was, how do you hold so many states inside a Planck size remnant? Because you can start with the black hole, which is arbitrarily big. And in the end, the remnant is only Planck mass and size. So it must have at least this many states in it, e to the s entanglement states. But how do you fit so many states inside that remnant? There were no good models for the remnant. So there were some troubles with the remnant idea also. So then what is the solution to this puzzle? So both the possibilities are giving us some trouble. If you, if you completely evaporate the black hole, then this thing doesn't have any state. If you leave a remnant, then the question is, how do you make a remnant? How do you make something which is so small and has arbitrarily many states? So this is what is called the black hole information paradox. So in the black hole, the, why did the paradox come? Because in the black hole, the entanglement just kept rising because this pair production way of producing the pairs. But in normal bodies, that doesn't happen. In normal bodies, like a piece of coal, suppose that a photon is emitted by an atom, it is completely possible that the atom is emitted with the remaining, with the, the photon is emitted with the remaining atom because the photon comes out as spin up, the atom may be left with spin down. If the photon comes out as spin down, the atom is left with spin up. So if the initial atom was in a singlet, after it emits a photon, then the photon and the atom together make a singlet, but each of them is entangled with the other one. But after some time, this atom also floats out like ash because the, if you want to model the coal as if it completely goes away, then this will also come out. So all the things at infinity, they're entangled with each other, not with what is in the vacuum. And so in the end, the entanglement is sort of comes down because there is nothing there. 
and this is called the normal phase curve of a, of a normal body. But in the black hole, because they're getting it out of the vacuum, the reproduction happening from the vacuum, the entanglement keeps going up, and that's what leads to the paradox. So let us see how we're going to solve this puzzle. But first, people worried that could there be some small errors in Hawking's calculation, and could that perhaps resolve the problem? Suppose whatever Hawking said the state was, suppose there was some small correction to the state, but well, why should a small correction help? It may help because the number of particles n that we produce is of course very large because the black hole is a very big thing, so it produces many, many particles. So suppose there was a 1% error in each pair because some quantum gravity effect that Hawking did not notice. Is it possible that if we produce more than 100 pairs, uh, everything will get corrected and the entanglement will go away and the graph will come down? So people for a long time were thinking that something like that would happen, but in fact, you can prove that it will not happen. If the correction at each step is order epsilon, the entanglement actually keeps growing and you can at most make a reduction of two epsilon at each step. So the graph is still going up like this, may go slightly down like this, but actually can't come down. So this is going to be very important because it says that any small corrections of quantum gravity are not going to solve your puzzle. Okay? So you need to completely change the, the structure of the black hole. So it should be nothing like pair creation at all. It, it just can't be that you have a vacuum here. Because so, if you have a vacuum around the horizon, we have seen that you are going to produce pairs that were Hawking calculation. We've also seen the reason because the vacuum is unstable there. So it produces the pairs. If we have anything like that, we cannot actually save the puzzle. That's what the small correction theorem is saying. We have to completely change everything. Otherwise, we are stuck. Yes, there was a question. So this corrections only change the slope, but that will not uh, like produce the page curve. That's right. It will not produce the page curve. It can at most change the slope because there's an inequality, right? It may not change it at all, but certainly it cannot change it more than this. That's the point. It cannot bring it below this line. Yes. Okay. okay. So small corrections, the horizon will not solve the problem. Where are you going to get big corrections from? Well, this is the remarkable thing we found in string theory starting in 1997, that when you actually try to make a bound state of strings and brains, People thought that the bound state of strings and all will always be of size Planck length because the natural scale of string tension and brain tension is Planck, Planck length or string length, something small. But when you actually increase the coupling, like at weak coupling, that's how we know how to make strings and brains. But they thought that when the coupling is strong enough to make a black hole, we have enough particles there to make a black hole. The strings and brains will make some Planck size object in the middle and then a normal black hole horizon will emerge at long distances. But what we found was that was not the case. When you put more strings and brains into some region, the size of the bound state you make out of them, it actually becomes bigger. The size of the bound state depends on how many particles you put there. And what was interesting was the size of the bound state was always of order of the horizon size. It was not something which was much smaller or Planck length or some fixed length like that. It's always of the horizon size. So it gave, gave rise to the idea that maybe in string theory, you can never make a, a horizon. Of course, if you can never make a horizon, then there is no Hawking puzzle. So then people found that you actually end up, so this is just a picture. Every time you try to make a bound state of strings and brains, you get something like this, uh, you never actually end up getting a horizon. So this is of course just a cartoon. So once you try to understand what happened, how come things don't make a black hole in string theory? Normally you think the gravity is so strong around the horizon, it sucks everything in, that's the gravitational collapse. It has to make a black hole. What else can we possibly have which doesn't collapse into itself? And what happens is in string theory, there are interesting effects which are not there in ordinary quantum gravity. And they are what allow this kind of object, which we call the fuzzball, to form. So, so let's make a cartoon description of what is the structure of a fuzzball. Was there a question for me? Yes. Uh, so what is the characteristic quantity which uh, defines the uh, structure of the fuzzball? Because it's kind of some fuzziness inside some structure. So, so how, how you define that? So I will say that in a minute. Let me just go through the slide and then I will answer that actually. Okay, okay, okay. So the idea was that in three, we live in three space and one time dimension. And this was our picture at the horizon. And inside the horizon, we had a place where we could put negative energy and so on. But let me for simplicity, simplicity draw only one space direction. So I drew that. And here's the mass M. This is the point where the horizon radius is. And inside the radius, we have seen I can put net negative energy. So I'm just drawing one dimension. But now suppose there are extra dimensions, like in string theory, there are six extra dimensions. I've drawn one of them like a small circle. So my one space line now looks like a drinking straw. So of course, extra dimensions have been around for a long time, but people thought they have no special significance for the black hole problem because now you can 
have this small extra dimension everywhere, but let's say radius of the black hole is three kilometers and the compact dimension, let's say, is Planck length, then you could do everything you were doing before, but just say everywhere there's an extra circle of Planck length, nothing seems to have changed because you can still have this horizon here and you can say the negative energy particles can be placed here. So everything looks the same as before. But now actually a completely different topological structure is possible. You take that drinking straw, you cut off the middle part and you discard it away. And then the ends of the drinking straw, you smoothly close like this, like the end of a cigar. Now this is a new topology. You cannot make this if you didn't have the extra dimension because then you won't close this smoothly like a cigar. Then you will just have a line and suddenly at the end of the line, you will fall into nothing. So you shouldn't have that. Right now that's not happening. This is a smooth manifold. You come like this, you smoothly go back here. You come like this, you smoothly go back here. It's a completely smooth manifold. But now the region inside where I had all the negative energy things, they are not even there. But what about the initial mass M which made the black hole? Where has that gone? Well, if I have to have this curvature, that effectively equals energy and all that mass M of the black hole is sitting in this curvature. So this completely new topology, which, you, which I have just talked about, this was in one dimensions. In more dimensions, something similar will happen. You take this entire region, which is of order radius 2m, and you remove it from space-time and you throw it away. Then everywhere in space-time, we have a small circle. As you readily approach this place of where you throw away this interior, so you seem to have a boundary. When you come there, you close off this completely like this. You come here, you close this off completely. Okay. There's a slight twist here, which you can twist clockwise, anti-clockwise, so you make a closed circle and monopole, anti-monopole. I'm not going to details of that, but there's topological structures here. And so I've called them minus plus. You can choose any combination of those. Different ways of twisting them at different angular directions gives you different states of the first ball. But then all the structures you make are different topological structures. And what has happened is that far away from the black hole, the space-time is three plus one dimensions, tensor directly with the compact dimension, which could be six circles, T6. But inside this region, the compact directions are not trivially tensored with the non-compact directions. You can see that they have been mixed up with all the other directions. So all the 10 dimensions are forming a topological structure, which cannot be written as a tensor product of three plus one dimensions and some compact manifold. So all the fuzz balls have that kind of a structure. So from now on, I'll just depict it like that that something like that has happened. The explicit models of this you can see in the papers, but what has happened is just to summarize, every time you take some strings and brains, you put them together, you increase the coupling to a point where this should make a black hole. Instead of getting a singularity and then vacuum around it, you end up getting one of these structures, which is what we call the first ball. But because this thing has a normal surface, it radiates from a surface like a normal object. There's no vacuum pair creation. It behaves like a piece of coal and there is no information back. So maybe uh, this might answer the question people are just asking, what is the structure of the first ball? But so this is the answer. It's a region where the compact dimensions are no longer tensored with the non-compact dimension. So that resolves the information paradox. And I think the information paradox has been thoroughly resolved for a long time because of this first ball paradigm. These days people still talk about things like they'll have this wormholes and islands, but what they call the islands is just the same as the remnant. And the wormhole method then says that from the remnant, we can extract the information out by a wormhole. Uh, I don't think any of that is correct. So I will not actually go in that direction. I will just assume that the information paradox is solved by the fuzz ball paradigm. And I will then turn into applying this to cosmology. Because now that we have solved the information paradox, you'll find we still have two important questions which are left. And the two questions are connected to each other. The first question is, even though we have solved all the time independent configurations of mass M in string theory, and we have found they are not like this, they are like this, they are like one box. So that's fine, that's all the information puzzle there, but there's still part of the puzzle left. How did you form the first ball? Because suppose you start with a star, that's just a ball of dust and it is collapsing. My time goes upwards and the, this is the angular direction, this is the radial direction. Then when it passes through the horizon, all the curvatures are low, all the densities are low. It seems it will smoothly go through the horizon. Once it is inside the horizon, all kinds of new physics can happen when the curvature becomes high. We always agree that new physics can happen from quantum gravity at high curvatures. But when it goes through the horizon, the curvature is low. So at that time, we think nothing new can happen. But once it's inside the horizon, the light cones are turned inwards. Nothing can go from here out back to the horizon or outside because light cones point inwards. So if you cannot violate causality, at least not in any large way, then whatever new physics happens here, it cannot change the horizon. If it cannot change the horizon, you will have the pair production like this and you will be back to the information puzzle. So how did we avoid the information puzzle? How did this new effective cause fuzzballs 
that create fuzz balls, how can they happen? I mean, because when the dust is passing through the horizon, nothing big is happening. It's all low curvature. So what triggers the formation of a fuzz ball? If nothing triggers it and something new can happen here, then it cannot now come back and affect the horizon because whatever new happens here is tight because of the light cones to stay only its effects inside. But then you may say there could be small effects which could leak outside the horizon. Small quantum, quantum gravity waves can do anything, but that won't solve the puzzle because the small correction theorem tells us that small effects will not solve, solve anything. So this is the puzzle I want people to focus on that if I don't have any big effects happening right at the horizon scale, then how am I going to get out of the standard puzzle? This is what people are always worried about. When the ball passes through the horizon, nothing big is happening. Once it goes inside the horizon and goes to a singularity, you can invoke new effects, but what can they do? So let me take the question. There was a question. Yeah, somewhere I was asking the questions uh, to start. Uh, where our discussion was, the Vacom actually has many black holes, let's say. Uh, suppose I will consider charged black holes as well as positively charged black holes and negatively charged black holes, and I will yeah, put yeah. them also vacuum. Will they not yeah, like yeah. give an extra, they will annihilate among themselves, etc. cetera, nothing, nothing stops them to coming into each other, merging each other, annihilating each other. So by yeah, yeah. that, those facts into account, annihilation and creation of black hole pairs inside the vacuum. Yeah. Will some of our arguments which we are discussing will change? Have you thought about that? Yeah. So you're saying, what about the creation and annihilation of vacuums and of black holes? They can interact, they can merge. That's what you're worrying about. Yes, right? yes, yes. Both of them can merge. Yeah. So that's a very relevant question, but let me just go back to an earlier slide to answer that. It's very important that that does not happen for the following reason. So uh -huh. you remember that I was showing you these pictures about how to get the most entropy. Yeah. So suppose you have this phase where you have lots of black holes. Let's even take neutral black holes because even they can merge. So the point is, if you make these black holes merge and become one black hole, uh -huh. but suppose the volume is fixed, right? Now, suppose I don't allow the volume to expand. Hmm. This thing actually has less entropy than this. We yeah. check that because the sum of these areas is more than the area of one black hole. So just for entropic reasons, it cannot merge. Our intuition that black holes like to merge is only coming when you put the black hole in asymptotically flat space, empty space, in which case these guys can merge and the black hole will become bigger. That's so right. this is what we had on this earlier slide. Yes. That if I let them merge and become one black hole, I can yeah. get even more entropy. And that is true, but it will not fit in the original box. So if my volume is fixed, then yeah. if I had to merge them into one black hole, my entropy goes down, so it will not merge. Now in cosmology, when we come to that, because the space is repeating, like there's something here, but there's something somewhere else also. Mm -hmm. So in cosmology, if you say these guys want to merge and make one big black hole, they don't yeah. have the space to do that because these guys are there, they'll run into those guys. So in cosmology, we have to think about fixed volume rather than fixed energy. And that's where the intuition changes. Yeah, that's right. But what I was wondering is that will this, uh, when two black holes of opposite charge will merge and uh, they may not give you a bigger black hole. So all those vacuum fluctuations are already included in the picture. So when I draw this picture that you have these vacuum fluctuations, these fluctuations are coming, they are going, they can merge, they can break, they can do everything. But okay. we will just see that for entropic reasons, the fluctuations have to be there. Because even when you think of electron positron fluctuations, yeah. they are coming, they are going. Sometimes they make a positronium, that's like a black hole, right? So that's there can true. be positronium fluctuations also, because positron yeah. is a bounce of electron and positron. So yeah. positron fluctuation will come, it will disappear. So yes. absolutely, electron positron can be created, they can form positroniums, that's like a merger, then they can yeah. break again, all that yeah. is happening. Okay. And the other point I was worrying is that uh, even in three plus one dimension, suppose instead of only black holes, if I consider there, there are brains or some black brains yes. inside yes. our vacuum, will they make any dip, the, uh, any, dip, any difference in our uh, calculation or argument in this set of things. But no one talks about information paradox in for black brains. Why is that? Or I miss something, or I miss something with that I don't understand. So I think you can talk about the information paradox. The only thing is if the black brain is infinite, like normally to take infinite black brains, yeah. then the total amount of information is also infinite, total amount of entropy is infinite. So it's difficult to draw the page curve and say, okay, now my entropy is going to come down or how much entropy is left because the area, is, everything is infinity. 
If That's you wrap right. the black brain on some torus to make it finite, yeah. well, the, that is fine because then it looks more like a black hole from the non-compact point of view. That's right, yeah. So even if I start with a black brain and I compactify some of the dimension, I'm back to the square one and I'm in this, this is two. This yeah. is what I conclude, right? Yeah, yeah, that you can do. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Thanks. absolutely. That you can do. So, so, so here, we, I'm just stating to you, uh, coming back to what I was saying here, the usual black hole puzzle is actually a dynamical puzzle also, not just the problem of static hole. When a dust ball is collapsing, when it goes to the horizon, then you can't stop that. And once it's inside, whatever you do, it can't affect the thing. So how do you ever get out of the puzzle? So the second related question to this is, which is now going to connect us back to cosmology. The black hole puzzle has something very direct to say about cosmology. If you look at an expanding cosmology, then in the, you have a cosmological horizon and there is stuff, light cones pointing inwards, then everything is just time reversed. Outside the cosmological horizon, the light cones point outwards. So here, if you just reverse the direction of time, because you can always take t to minus t, because we always have CPT invariance in the world, the universe looks like this. If you just change the direction, then the light cones point inwards, and you can see this is just like the picture of the black hole. Now, this is what is the difference from the black hole, of course. In the black hole, you have some dust inside and then you have the horizon, the light cones are pointing in. But then outside, you have empty space. But in the universe, of course, there's dust filling, filling all the way. So then you may say, this is not like the black hole. So how do we connect the cosmology problem to the black hole? But we can do that using the Burkhoff theorem. And the Burkhoff theorem says that if you have a spherical symmetric dust configuration, then if you take the outside part of some region of radius r, it cannot affect what is happening inside because it's spherical symmetry. Even in Newtonian mechanics, if something is spherically symmetric, then the gravity of the stuff outside doesn't affect what happens inside some radius r. So the outside you can change completely or remove. But the same is also true with general relativity. The Burkhoff theorem holds in classical general relativity. So if we throw away the outside, we can make it the vacuum. The inside should have the same evolution as before. So in fact, this is a well-known fact. The dust collapse of a dust ball has the same equations as the equations of cosmology, because the cosmological equation for dust, if you throw away the outside, the inside has to evolve the same way, whether the outside was present or not, and that's exactly the same evolution as a dust ball. Okay, so actually because of the Birkhoff theorem, there's a very close connection between cosmology and the black hole. You can see it looks exactly the same. So you can say, okay, the Birkhoff theorem may not hold with quantum mechanics or quantum gravity. It's a classical theorem, so there could be some small corrections. So maybe you cannot map the cosmology of the black hole exactly, but uh, you can almost map it because the small corrections will not change anything. And the small correction theorem tells us that the information paradox is not going to be solved by any small corrections. So, okay, it looks like if I start by with what is in the cosmology and look in the sky, we can actually see regions like this, which are actually such that they have collapsed inside their horizon. We'll ignore the outside because the Birkhoff theorem says we can ignore the outside. So we look in the sky, we look at a region which, has, which is smaller than its own horizon, and now we can see something like a dust ball, which has gone inside the horizon. Okay, now that is very interesting because anybody who tries to solve the black hole information paradox doesn't have to be fuzz ball, this could be anything. Anybody who tries to solve the information paradox will usually say that some new effects happen when the dust ball is squeezed inside the horizon. But if there's any such effects, why are we not seeing it? We look at this region in the sky and we say, look, this region looks like a region inside its own horizon we are not seeing any new big departures from semi-classical physics. So assuming we can use the Birkhoff theorem, it seems that the sky should show us some information and here are the numbers. If you're an observer today, this is time going up. This is today's universe. This is the universe in the past. If you look at this particular time in the past, I gave some numbers here while you're still in the dust phase. You can see some ball in the sky, which if you compute what its own horizon radius was for that much mass, it's much bigger. The horizon radius for that was Rs, and the radius of the ball was called RP, then RP upon RS is two times 10 to the minus four. It means we can look at regions in the sky, which are a dust ball, which has been squeezed to one upon two times 10 to the minus, roughly 10 to the four times. So it has been squeezed to a by a factor two times 10 to the minus four compared to its horizon radius. It's really been squeezed to very small radius compared to the horizon. And so if any new effect should happen when something has squeezed to a, a small fraction of its horizon radius, you should be seeing it. But we don't see anything unusual in the sky. The usual idea of you know, radiation dominated universe and big bang nucleus synthesis and all, it's working. So in some way we can map the black hole puzzle to cosmology, but in another way that faces us with the paradox, 
We're looking in the sky to something which has squeezed inside the horizon. And whatever your favorite solution to the information puzzle is, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. Forget first balls, whatever your solution might be, it still looks like semi-classical physics up there in the sky. So then how will this work? The only way this could be consistent is that the Birkhoff theorem, which is what allowed us to throw away the outside and keep only the inside, that's how we mapped it to the black hole puzzle, somehow that must be failing at the cosmological scale and we will see it actually does fail. So let's just to summarize what I just said, we need two things, A and B, which I just said. Well, uh, the black hole forms from a dust ball and the light poles turn in. How do we ever end up making a fuzz ball from it? In cosmology, we need some new physics. So we will see what causes this. We will get the answer for this. In cosmology, we will see that whatever provides the answer to this puzzle in the black hole gives us this new picture over here of all these uh, virtual black holes that I was talking about. It forces that picture. It will actually then give us all these things that are puzzles in cosmology, maybe energy for infrared, maybe energy for dark energy, and solve this puzzle we have with the Birkhoff theorem. All these will get solved at the same time. So let's talk about the virtual fluctuations of first ball. That's what we have been aiming at all through. So now let's get down to it and see what our picture is. So our picture is that if the first ball exists as on-shell configurations, there must also be virtual fluctuations. So that is natural. If you have actually got uh, you know, on-shell first balls, then you on-shell uh, positroniums, then you can also have virtual fluctuations of positroniums. So you know, all the things have to also exist as virtual fluctuations. But then we said with this thing before also. Very big black holes, you might say they are very unlikely fluctuations. Maybe a Planck size black hole might be okay for you, but a big black hole, what's the probability? Well, the probability is low because it's massive, but you have to multiply that by the number of possible black holes with that mass. And the number of possible black holes is given by e to the Bekestern entropy. And the Bekestern entropy for a big black hole is a very big number. And we will see shortly that this multiplication by this big number makes the overall fluctuation of a big mass object to be actually order one and not something which is suppressed. And that's why the gravitational vacuum has these fluctuations of all scales everywhere. And this will change our picture of the vacuum. So let's check the scales. Where are these large fluctuations are uh, not suppressed? I'm calling the radius of that RV because the fluctuations I'm going to call them as vectors. I'll explain in a minute why we call them vectors. But those are the fluctuations we are after. Let's do the numbers. The probability of fluctuation is roughly given by e to the minus some action. And the action is roughly energy into time. Let's put all those scales into the black hole. So the energy we'll put in the mass of the black hole. Let's work in d plus one space-time dimensions. You can put d plus three if you want, but it works in all dimensions. So then the mass is given like this in terms of the radius. The Planck length is here. So the g Newton is just the Planck length to the power d minus one. So this is just the basic relation for the mass in terms of the radius. The time scale over which you want to do this, all time scale are put as same as the radius of the black hole. Everything I'll just put, put the speed of light to one. So I'll put it also to R. So the action I must use, it comes out like this. It's just the radius of the black hole upon the Planck length, the power D minus one. And as expected, if you're looking for a fluctuation of a black hole whose radius is much bigger than Planck length, the probability will be very small, e to the minus s. But the number of these fluctuations is very large, e to the s Bekenstein, and how much is s Bekenstein? Area upon g. Area upon g is r upon l Planck to the d minus one. So now you see this is e to the power this, and this is e to the power minus this. Even though we have not been careful with the prefactors, we see that now there's the possibility that the prefactors cancel, and that suppression, which you get because of the high mass of these objects, can be offset by the large degeneracy of these objects. So we're not proving the factor of order one. We have given indirect arguments for that in other places, but right now I'm just going to take that as an assumption that this cancellation actually happens. And so there's no suppression because without that, we will see we actually cannot solve the information paradox. The other thing we wanted to say about these fuzz balls, the reason we call them vectors, is that these fuzz balls, it turns out, are very interesting objects. If you try to compress them, they don't want to compress. If you try to stretch them, they don't want to stretch. They're sort of like you know, balls and springs joined to each other. So when you try to do anything to them, compress or stretch, it costs you extra energy. Well, that we can see from the fuzz balls we have made. We know how to what fuzz balls look like, and I have not shown you much about the structure of the fuzz balls. But you can imagine they were roughly had some kind of topological structure, and if you were to squeeze the topological structure, its energy goes up. If you were to stretch it, its energy also goes up. So you can think of it like a molecule. If you squeeze a molecule, its energy goes up. If you stretch it, its energy goes up. It has a given topological structure. It just wants to be at that given radius. Well, how much is the energy which you get if you do squeeze it? Well. There are some indirect arguments about fuzz balls, and they suggest that the energy cost, suppose you change the radius by a factor of order one, suppose delta is 0.5. 
So the energy change that you have to, the energy you have to put in to do that is of the order of the black hole radius, black hole mass of that radius. So that's not unreasonable. There's only one scale in the problem. If you have a radius R, the mass of the black hole is M of R. And if you squeeze that by a factor of, let's say, by 50%, the energy increase is of the order of M of R. So we'll assume that for the virtual fluctuation, the similar property exists. Uh, we don't know enough about the virtual fluctuations to prove that, but I'll assume that the virtual ones, I call them vectors for the virtual fluctuation, V is for the virtual. Uh, I'll call the radius R sub V instead of R, but I'll assume exactly the same property. The virtual fluctuations are drawn in gray. The actual on-shell fuzz balls I've drawn with the expert structure, uh, but the virtual fuzz balls, which are in gray, when you squeeze them, we'll assume they have the same kind of property. So now this is our picture of the quantum gravity vacuum. We have these virtual fluctuations everywhere, and now we can say why I was calling them vectors. They are virtual fluctuations. The important thing is they are extended in size. Okay, we said they are big objects. They are not like Planck scale or some big scale. They're extended scale fluctuations, and they are compression resistant. We said they don't want to compress, and the OHS for objects. So they are virtually extended compression resistant objects, and these things are all over the place. So the nature of the quantum gravity vacuum is not like something just happening at the Planck scale and everywhere else there's nothing to see. It's more like the kind of vacuum you get in a phase transition. Like if you have water which is on the boiling point, you get bubbles of steam of all different sizes in it. Or if you have an Ising model near criticality, you have bubbles of in the, inside the minus spin down uh, vacuum, you have bubbles of, uh, of upspin of all different sizes. And similarly, in the quantum gravity vacuum, it's not like you only have structure at the Planck scale. That will like an Ising model not near the critical point then everything is only at the scale of you know, one spin might be up, but otherwise they're all down. But when you get near criticality, it's different. Inside the uh, all spins down, there'll be bubbles of arbitrarily size in which all spins are up. So is that the kind of picture of the quantum gravity vacuum that we are going to see uh, is actually suggested by these calculations we just did. And we'll see that that picture will solve all the problems. So what is the effect of this vector structure in the world? Why don't we see it? If you first look at a low curvature object like a star, suppose this was a virtual fluctuation before, you put the star, it has a weak gravitational pull. A star doesn't have much gravity. If you pull on the vector, the vector doesn't want to compress. Maybe it compresses by a small amount, like 1%, and then stabilizes there. And so this change of the vacuum, when you apply a gravitational field, the vacuum changes a bit because the vacuum fluctuations change a bit. It's already included in the normal Einstein's equation because, you know, even the positronium, electron, positron fluctuation, they all change a little bit when you change the, the metric gently, but all those are included in the vacuum, uh, vacuum energy. So all this is already included in the normal Einstein action. So nothing new to see here. But in the black hole, we'll see something special will happen. This was a traditional picture of the black hole. The dust ball collapsed, it became smaller, the light cones turned in, and we saw that then how does the information ever get out? But now we have to ask one, a new question. Is there virtual fluctuations of all sizes around every point? What happened to these vectors, these virtual fluctuations, which were trapped inside this horizon radius? What happens to them? But now you see something interesting. If the dust ball had to keep collapsing, the virtual fluctuation here also has to squeeze. Like if you had a positronium was inside the uh, horizon, it also has to squeeze because the light cones point inwards. But if you keep squeezing this particular vector structure, we have seen it doesn't want to squeeze. It's a topological structure. If you keep squeezing it, at some point it will break. It cannot stabilize because the light cones point in and so anything has to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And so these virtual guys also have to keep squeezing. And let us see what is the effect of that. Here's the virtual fluctuation, the vector in gray, which I have drawn. As it squeezes, it distorts, its wave function distorts by order unity. And the virtual fluctuation then turns into an on-shell fuzz ball and that's where you end up. So it's these virtual fluctuations that actually become the fuzz ball. And that is the explanation for how as the light goes turn in, you actually end up creating a fuzz ball. When you distort the vacuum wave function by order one, the fact it becomes on-shell objects, that is familiar to us from a much simpler situation. Like when you have vacuum modes of a scalar field, when you distort them by order one, you get Hawking radiation. That is, you get on-shell pair production. The particle production in curved space, it just means the vacuum modes, when you change the vacuum mode structure a little bit by order one, uh, they become on-shell particles. But here we're not talking of just vacuum modes or particles. We're talking of virtual functions of entire macroscopic structures. And when their functional vacuum function, wave function changes because of squeezing by order one, they become the so on Can I ask a question in this, at this point? Yeah. yeah. Well, if this is the vacuum fluctuation we are talking about, and this is the true vacuum should have also the black holes or 
whatever give rise to the structure of fudge balls we are telling. In yes. our defining equations of pressure and energy density, all right, we took the vacuum expectation value of energy momentum tensor in yes. the quantum picture when we are discussing this, we are supposed to take the expectation value of this new vacuum we are talking of, not the what creation operator destroys or creates or yes. any level of the vacuum. So should not we think that also we should go back and do the calculation what happens to pressure and energy density with this new idea of our true vacuum? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. So the reason we had all the discussion in the beginning of the talk about the normal scale of fields and how we get from that, we will now realize that that was all completely misplaced and that's why it was not going anywhere. Absolutely, absolutely. The real scale of energy in the quantum gravity vacuum is completely ah. dominated by these objects. Yes. And if you let's say have some very high curvature, then you can't form black holes bigger than the curvature scale. You can't get this kind of vacuum energy. And these kind of effects control the entire energy of the vacuum. It has nothing to do with the Planck scale. And that's why we have not been able to solve the cosmical constant problem for a long time, because I think we have not understood the nature of the vacuum. We kept sure. thinking it was something happening at the Planck scale, but the important effects are not at the Planck scale. Because if yeah. they were at the Planck scale, you can never resolve the information paradox. Because Absolutely. Absolutely. this argument of the small correction theorem tells you that this is the important thing which I have at the bottom of this slide. If there are no extended structures in the vacuum, like this gray vector I have drawn here, if everything was local, then the equilibrium principle tells you every point on the surface of the star can go into this without any problem. And once it is inside, causality tells you you can't do anything. So if nothing can, if there's nothing extended, which can see that the closed top surface has formed. If there's nothing extended, it can only see local physics. Only local physics can never see that a horizon is forming because that's a global object. If you can never see the horizon forming and you're trapped inside it, nothing can ever get you out because of causality. That's why people could never solve the information problem for a long time. So you need the extended structures in the vacuum, otherwise the puzzle cannot be solved. And once you have the extended structures in the vacuum, everything changes because the energy is going to be dominated by these guys and you start asking every question from scratch. So that's exactly, I think, what you were asking and that's exactly what I want here also. Okay, okay, okay. Now, only thing I make a comment here is that yeah. it reminds me that I have to tell the students what is the true quantum vacuum for gravity theory before yeah. I tell them that how to take define energy pressure and energy of the theory. It reminds me Polchensky making a statement in ICTP when I was there that we should start teaching quantum mechanics and then go to the classical limit instead of telling classical mechanics, then how to quantize the theory. And even he made a stronger statement saying that we should teach first supersymmetry then start telling them any other symmetry and then tell them that from supersymmetry, how do we go to other symmetry? So now you are telling me that Next time be prepared when you go to the class, first teach them what is the two quantum, quantum gravity vacuum before you ask them that how to define pressure and energy. So I have to come from to, top to the bottom. Maybe this is the best way we have to write a textbook how to do these things to teach the students. Yeah, so of course not for the learning about atomic structure or ordinary quantum mechanics. No, 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 you no, have no, to no, ask no, any no, fundamental no, questions. Uh, yeah. I'm not talking about them because they, they, they don't care about our uh, Issues we are discussing about, which is intrinsic to gravity theory at, at, a, at a high energy. And uh, so for those people who are interested, the course should be properly designed. How do we properly incorporate these things so that from the beginning we, uh, I mean, I'm just suggesting you, the course should be properly designed. How should we, how should we uh, pipeline in their mindset that what we are doing, there will be many changes later on, or we come back. This is what we start, how we connect it from true quantum gravity to classical quantum gravity, other way around I'm suggesting. Yeah, yes, I, I think I, I, I would agree with that. I think the whole point is that everything we have to learn, at least for cosmology, we have to completely start from scratch because we don't understand what happens when space expands, you have to know what the gravity is like. Absolutely. We can't actually throw away the Planck scale issues and say we can deal with cosmology at the large scale today because all the large scale problems are actually going to come from the large scale structure of the vacuum and the vacuum actually has structure at the large scale. Yeah. So that's Maybe exactly what we are saying point, here. Other point which bodies means that uh, even in the expanding universe, the moment we talk about the expanding universe, we have made compromise with principle of relativity. I don't yeah. understand what is an expanding universe how does it make sense when we saw Minkowski space-time or Lorentzian space-time? 
because we have separated that. We have already chosen that everything is sacred about the time direction and everything happens only in the special dimension where expansion is taking place. So that is already the failure of the principle of relativity at that point. Um, I don't know whether you will agree with me or not, but this is what is my, my thought is that the moment we talk about expanding space time, we are only talking about expansion in spatial dimension, not in the time dimension. So what happens to the uh, principle of relativity uh, or, or any uh, anything we talk about Minkowskian or Lorentzian structure of the, of the uh, space time or the manifold we are talking about. So we have already divided them into uh, we have already started treating space and time differently. No, but I have a comment. Like, I, I, I agree with the fact that you were saying that from the structure of the metric that the spatial uh, part is basically expanding. But you can do kind of coordinate transformation. You can write uh, in terms of conformal coordinate where the, the whole expansion effect is basically taken out. No, I understand what we say. We tell that instead of FRW matrix, try treating, uh, try uh, treating everything in um, visitor space time. But at the end, when we are talking of the time, it is the cosmic time we are talking of. Whatever Samir has talked to all this whole time now, time is always cosmic time. Okay. Am I, am I, I right? have a comment on that. Maybe, maybe I can just continue with what I was saying and we can discuss this at the end because yeah. I didn't have any direct comment on that. Okay. Good, go ahead. Go ahead, Samir, go ahead and finish that. We'll talk. Yeah, so I'm almost done because this is the last part of my talk. So now all that we have learned is that from the black hole, we have to have this picture. We cannot solve the information paradox unless there are some extended virtual fluctuations. We have found that there are on chill objects like that in string theory by construction. We have given the argument by probability that the probability of these fluctuations is order one because of cancellation with the Bekerstein entropy. And then we have seen that there is a picture by which we can solve the information paradox. And we have seen with the small correction theorem that any small corrections to this picture will not solve the puzzle. So we are forced to this picture to solve the information paradox. So now we have to see if we have these virtual fluctuations all over of these large black hole type objects, what does it actually do for cosmology? So this part is all conjectural because in cosmology there are many issues we don't have very clear from observations, but we'll see what kind of things can happen. And we already said that uh, here we get, we have trapped surfaces where the light cones point in, here we have anti-trapped surfaces where the light cones point out. So just like here we said that the vectors inside the horizon are forced to squeeze because the light cones point in. Here we can see that any vector which is larger than the, any virtual fluctuation which is larger than the horizon size, it is forced to expand because the light cones point purely out. It can't even stand in one place because the light cones point like this. Just like here, something couldn't stand in fixed radius because the light cones point inwards like this. So if these vectors are going to stretch. That is going to cost energy because we already said that these objects don't like to stretch. But here they are being forced to stretch. Just like here, uh, there was a stretching inside the compression inside the black hole horizon. In the cosmological horizon, there's going to be stretching. So this is the uh, role of how the cosmological horizon is going to be uh, play a role which is analogous to the black hole horizon. And now we have to see what it means. But then actually, uh, so this energy from this stretching, that's what I just said, uh, these vectors in the, which are between this and this size will be forced to stretch. And the energy from this stretching will give the energy for all the new effects we seek. So we know that in the sky, there are many, many puzzles like where is this energy coming from or that energy coming from and so on. You will see that the energy of stretching of these vectors is of the right scale for these kinds of energies because on the scale of the closure energy density. And then because we see these vector stretching and a macroscopic care is going on and can be an extra source of energy, it can come in perhaps to solve exactly all the difficulties that we have. But at this point, we will see a big difference between Minkowski space and the cosmological situation. In Minkowski space, we had vectors of all sizes. Right? We, we saw that and saw that the fluctuation would have all possible sizes. And we needed that because otherwise, if they sort of stopped at, let's say, one kilometer radius, then if you make a black hole of 10 kilometer radius, the puzzle for that will not be solved. So we needed them to be of all different sizes. But in an expanding cosmology, you cannot have any structure which is larger than the distance that light has had to travel since the Big Bang. So because of the particle horizon, as we call it, light can only travel so much from the Big Bang and you cannot actually form any coherent structure like this kind of virtual fuzz ball fluctuation, which is bigger than the cosmological horizon. So let's compute that. So you take a flat cosmology again, like we did before, it's homogeneous and isotropic. 
And you know that the scale factor will take you to go like t to the alpha. And the Hubble constant then is alpha over t. And the Hubble radius is h inverse, so that is t over alpha. So in this the standard calculations, you can see how far light has traveled since the Big Bang. And you can compute that. And you find it in proportion to t, but also the alpha comes in here. And so the size of the vector, we said it cannot be bigger than light has been able to travel. So we find we can write as a fraction of the Hubble radius, and you can find it is now less than or equal to this number. Okay, so we can form vectors only up to radii equal to this. This is just by causality. Now let's see some implications of this. In the radiation phase of the universe, alpha is equal to half. So remember, t to the alpha was the expansion rate. So in radiation phase, you have t to the half, so alpha is a half. That tells you the vector size compared to the Hubble radius, it always has to be less than or equal to one. So the vectors never get into the domain where they are forced to stretch. So there's no energy from stretching in the radiation phase. This is already very important because this is the consistency check. In the radiation phase, there is no room for any extra energy. Very little room because there the Big Bang nucleosynthesis puts a very strong constraint on how fast things can expand. Like even if we have one extra neutrino or one less neutrino, you get into trouble with you know, how fast things are expanding because then you won't produce as many neutrons as you require for the amount of helium you see and so on. So it's very nice that in the radiation phase, there's actually none of this extra energy. But let us see what happens when we get to the dust phase because the dust phase alpha is two thirds. So now if you look at this R upon the scale of the vectors, now all the time that they are between, this radius is between one and two, that is bigger than the Hubble scale and all the way up to twice the Hubble scale, this region, vectors in this region will be forced to stretch. Okay, so now the moment you enter the dust phase then, there's going to be some energy from the stretching of these objects. You can also compute how much they will stretch because after they'll stretch, stretch, but after some time, every radius comes inside the cosmological horizon. So you can see up to what point they will stretch. So you can see they at least have to stretch by this much. Okay, so what are the consequence of this stretching? We have seen when the radiation phase turns to the dust phase, that's when this stretching will happen. And this will lead to some extra energy which is not part of the usual way we think about the semi-classical energies that is available in the sky. But what is the scale of this energy? So we had noted the scale of this energy we said, if you compress it by order one or stretch it by order one, when delta is order one, the extra energy you get is all the, of the order of a black hole of mass of the order of, of for a radius of the order of the radius of the object here. Okay, how much is this in the cosmological terms? So let us set the radius of the object to be the Hubble radius. Then the energy which will come from it stretching by order one is the mass of something of the order of that radius, the Hubble radius. And so that is this, in, this is the R equals GM scale of the black hole. And that gives us the energy density, which is of this order. It's equal to H square over G, but H square is of the order of G times row closure from the Hubble expansion law. Anyway, you put all that together, you find the extra energy by stretching vectors of the Hubble radius by order one is of the order of the closure density. So here mu is a constant of order university uh, of, of order unity, but you can see the important thing we learned from this is that if you take the virtual fluctuations of the order of the horizon scale, you stretch them or compress them by a factor of order one, the extra energy density you get is of the order of the closure density. It's not surprising that it's the only one scale in cosmology you get, but we just had to check that. That's the scale, but that's what tells you this is very interesting because all the troubles we have with cosmological observation in the sky, they involve something to do with, you know, you need more than closure density or less than closure density, something of that order. And so this is the right scale to do that. And so everything we have seen so far, we can put on this graph. You first have a radiation phase, then you have the dust phase. The radiation to dust transition, we call the time T star, that's a matter radiation equal, equality time. And the Hubble scale is then changing. It grows at a certain rate in the uh, dust phase, and then it changes over into the uh, radiation phase. So the Hubble radius is changing in this way, going like this, and then it's going like this. But the maximum size of the uh, vector, the virtual fluctuations, we saw it had to be less than the dust phase Hubble constant up to here, and the radiation phase, it could be bigger than the, radiation, than the Hubble radius. So the radius of the virtual fluctuation, that's in blue. The red line gives you the Hubble scale, uh, the horizon scale. They are first up to the, they can first have to be less than or equal to the horizon scale, but in the dust phase, they can be more than the horizon scale. So the extra energy will start when you start getting into the dust phase. Okay. But how much energy do you get? If the change was adiabatic, then you'll just not get any energy because they have the adiabatic theorem. The change was sudden, you'll get a stretching by a factor of order one, but the change from radiation to dust happens 
you know, over a few Hubble time scales. So you get some fraction of, of one. So roughly speaking, if you put all that together, you find that you should get extra energy around the epoch of matter radiation equality, which is Z equal to this value, which is a small fraction of the closure density at this value. Okay, that's what you're roughly getting from this picture of the macros. Can that energy tell us anything? Well, interestingly, this is just the amount of energy you require to resolve some tensions in the values of Hubble constant that have been observed in recent times. If you look at local objects, it suggests a Hubble constant of 74, while the Lambda CDM model applied to cosmic microwave background fluctuations suggests an H naught of 6.67. And this tension has been quite significant at the beyond two sigma scale. And so an extra energy density of order of 10% of the closure density at T star has been postulated called the early dark energy EDE, and that can resolve the tension. But we have seen that's exactly the kind of thing we are automatically getting from what is happening because as you transition from the uh, radiation phase to the dust phase, you get the stretching of vectors which can give some small fraction of order one times the closure density at that time. So perhaps this is the kind of thing which could solve this puzzle. So we're not saying it does because we don't know enough about the dynamics of vectors to prove any of this. All we're going to say is we get energies of the right scales to be interesting for cosmological things coming from the dynamics of vectors. Uh, it's dark energy. Yeah. Change over was sudden. You will mind something like quench, etc., quantum quench, etc. How do I implement this? Change over is sudden. Are you talking about you will mind quantum quench or something like that? Yeah, so sudden means that suppose you had radiation phase and you could immediately change it to dust phase. Then you, you could call that a quench, but I mean, of course, in the real world, that doesn't happen. Right? The radiation yeah. to dust changeover happens over several Hubble times. Absolutely. Time scale, yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, so, so we had that, you, we said that the extra energy density you get from the vectors is some number of order one times the closure density. Suppose you get to a situation where mu is one. Okay, we're just playing around with this. Then the entire energy can come from the stretching of vectors. And then you find a self consistent situation where the extra energy comes because the vectors are larger than the Hubble scale. So they are being stretched. But the energy of the stretching gives you exactly energy required to maintain that particular Hubble scale, that expansion, the Hubble scale equation h squared equals uh, 8 pi over 3, 0. But in that case, you will uh, get to us, you can settle down to a situation where the extra energy of the vector stretching just maintains the expansion. So this energy, which we can think of as now dark energy, just coming from the vacuum doesn't require any other energy. You can just settle into a phase where you're completely dominated by dark energy, but dark energy is not coming from some crazy lambda which you have to find in some you know, fine tuning of something. It is just coming because these vector stretching, the stretching of the vectors are providing the energy required to maintain that particular expansion. So you have a natural way of fitting dark energy into this. And, and here was my last slide on this. If you go to inflation, Samir. it's also a situation where you want to get into a cosmical constant kind of thing. But we have seen that happens whenever the pressure drops, like we have a radiation phase and it goes to the dust phase. When the pressure drops, the Hubble graph is overshot by the vector graph and you get into the stretching phase. But in fact, when you come to the gut scale, the pressure also drops suddenly because before the gut scale, you had lots of particles, all the guts particles were, not, were relativistic. So they contributed pressure. Below the gut scale, only a few particles though of the standard model are left as relativistic particles, the others become non-relativistic, so sort of like going into dust phase. So again, because you get a drop of pressure at that time, the same thing can happen. You can overshoot and get to a phase where the energy density is then maintained by this extra stretching of vectors. And so again, the inflation can again, you can get trapped into the inflation phase, where again, you have the stretching of vectors like this, maintaining the energy density because the pressure drop when your gut particles become non-relativistic. So again, we don't know if any of these things happen, just saying that we have the right energy scales for all of these things to happen. So I tried your patience for a long time. So let me just try to summarize in just a couple of slides. The traditional picture of the quantum gravity vacuum, all the interesting effects of quantum gravity happen only at the flight scale. But if you do this, you get the black hole information paradox and you cannot get out of it. You can really prove that you cannot get out of this. So then resolving the paradox, if you go through what we have learned from string theory, the first ball paradigm, and then the virtual first ball fluctuation, gives us this picture that these virtual fluctuations of all sizes are always there and they are not suppressed. And the reason they were important is that if you have this picture, you cannot get out of the information paradox, but because the equivalence principle pushes you in. But if you have something which can feel all around the horizon, it can move when a horizon is forming and trigger something new, 
then you can get out of the information paradox. And then uh, that shows you that these vectors which we find in string theory have to be there. And this is my last slide then. In cosmology, we find that the opposite happens. Instead of a closed trapped surface, you get an empty trapped surface. And the stretching of these vectors gives you extra energy as the universe changes its expansion rate in different ways. Sometimes energy gets triggered, sometimes doesn't get triggered, but can get triggered in various ways whenever the expansion rate changes. So people keep asking, why is the Hubble constant of the order of one today? But according to this logic, if this logic was correct, it's because in the radiation phase, we just checked, you couldn't get any. When you change to the dust phase, it can happen. So changes happen when you change from the radiation phase to the dust phase, and you get a small fraction of the energy uh, of closure at that time. And that sort of is, uh, brings you closer to, the, closer to the energy scales you see for the dark energy today. But similar things can happen also at the inflation time, when the guts particles become non-relativistic, there's some jump in the Hubble constant. Whenever there's a jump in the slope of the Hubble constant, these guys get triggered. So that can give you lots of interesting effects in cosmology. It may give you completely different solutions to the puzzles than from what people are trying to fine tune when they keep the effect of the cosmos of the quantum gravity only at the black scale. Okay, thank you very much. I'll stop here. Yeah, Samir, uh, I, 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 can I ask now some questions? No, yes, please, yes. A little bit, little bit time. So uh, thank you very much, Samir, uh, for giving this nice talk. And uh, I believe that uh, we have uh, a lot of students we have learned a lot uh, like uh, so before going to the questions could you please go to your first slide when you have started just the first slide i just have to take one picture of your first slide that's the important okay i will, can also send you the entire pdf later on yeah that somebody, somebody please send me the entire pdf file because i would like to discuss many things Maybe I will okay. ask others, give others chance to ask questions. Because I have many questions now to ask you, but uh, okay. you please send me the PDF file and I will talk to, we will we'll talk later. Okay, sure. Yeah, so now the thing is, if you guys have any question, please ask. And uh, before that, I uh, would suggest Please give a clap for him for giving such a nice talk. That's very important. And uh, now you can ask questions. Uh, so let uh, me ask at this point, uh, this dark energy estimate you make here, that will only drive the lag time acceleration. What was the argument about what drives the inflation? Early so the day argument day? was the same, right? Because the argument was that inflation is very similar to dark energy today because they both require a lambda, effective lambda. And anything which provides extra energy can drive the kind of expansion we need. And the picture was that any time that you get these virtual fluctuations to become larger than the horizon size, then they keep stretching as the universe expands. When they stretch, there's energy, but that energy causes the more stretching so it can become a self-consistent solution. That's what we had checked. So. Suppose the universe size is very small, let's say, you know, one centimeter and yeah. the vector size is, let's say, 1.5 centimeter. Then yeah. you can sustain that self consistently, but because it's so small, you know, you get the cosmological constant stuck at that scale. But you can also make it 3000 megaparsec and the vector scale is also, let's say, 5000 megaparsec and then it can be self consistent because the 5000 bigger than 3000 megaparsec and that stretching will maintain that particular value of the closure density. So depending on what, it's a very dynamical thing now. Lambda is not a constant which is like fixed and given in the Lagrangian. It's not the lambda CDM people talk about as a constant. We are talking about a dynamical uh, cosmological constant. Yes, very much. Because it's just coming out of some property of the vacuum right now, some state of the vacuum, right? So yes, if the, the vacuum is in a state. Changes from early time, from zero time to time now, that's where that also solves the Hubble, ten, Hubble parameter tensor. That's what I understood. Okay, let me see if I understand the question. What I was saying about the Hubble tension was in this slide. Uh, so, the, when the Hubble rate changes, the red line is the Hubble is the Hubble radius, yes. H inverse. So when it changes at that time, extra energy can be induced here because yes, this right. graph overshoots this graph. Yes. Okay. Hi. So so then the so we we get extra energy exactly at around t star of the order of some fraction of the closure energy density, but that's exactly what is required for the Hubble tension yeah. at that time. T star is what they want. That's right. So your argument is this blue line can be uh, achieved if you consider this uh, uh, like additional energy and all. 
from this conclusion. Yeah, this, yes. that, 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 that's that's the the point. Yeah. This, this, this will cause this uh, Hubble tension. Yeah. So it's the right scale to solve the Hubble tension. We don't know if that's the correct answer because too, too little is known on both the sides of the theory of vectors and also of the observation at this point, I suppose. But it's of the right scale. So this is just to say that all cosmological issues should consider the vector issue. So I have one more doubt, actually not with the question. Throughout our analysis, we have assumed that thermodynamics is so sacred that nothing happens to that. Yes. But we are talking about temperature, low temperature to true high temperature, from present day's inverse temperature to what it was, temperature scale, the Big Bang. I do yes. assume that the thermodynamics remains sacred all the, the temperature regime from that to that. Can't there be thermodynamics, first law, second law, third law, thermodynamics can change over also these different temperature scale. So actually, I don't think that that is easy for me to bring in here because thermodynamics is just the law of large numbers, right? So yeah. once you have many states in something, it will all, always follow. So here, if you look at all the things we have, you know, if you have many, if you have radiation phase or dust phase, the, in cosmology, you always have many, many particles involved within the Hubble volume. When many particles are involved in the Hubble volume, then the it's just statistics. And all the fluctuations will be down by Poisson distribution thing, one by root n. And so the thermodynamic relation will be very accurate. So the first law or second law is just the law of large numbers, right? So yeah, but not, we... that can happen. Yeah, when we are so much telling you about dynamics of objects change from when we go from lower energy to higher energy, we never question what happens to the thermodynamics or statistics, not statistics in the sense, thermodynamics up to the system. When you go to large volume to small volume, when you go from large temperature to small temperature, is there a, like we are talking about uh, duality in string theory, is there such things? exist in thermodynamics. I believe those are not explored yet. We have already assumed that those are sacred and untouchable. I may be wrong. So, so I think that's a relevant question in the following sense that, for example, when we did the second part of this talk, I was saying, why is the equation of state not the one that we first thought? S yes, equals root exactly. yes. over G. Yes. But yes. there the reason was that because the universe has to expand, if the expansion time scale is comparable to the time scale of the equilibration of the system, then you cannot use that argument of thermodynamics. Yes. And if you just are in a radiation phase, then the time scales are very short of equilibration. So you do use it. Yeah, but if you think of the vectors, the vectors are so big, they're comparable yeah. to the horizon scale. Yeah, vectors you can use the equilibration. And so yeah. in fact, you cannot use the stack back. That's right. Okay. I so I actually use that fact there, that there was a failure of the First, we got an answer from using StatMech, but then we said that answer fails because yeah, the expansion yeah. rate is the same as the equilibration rate. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I think Yogesh wants to say something. Yeah, uh, Samir, uh, uh, hello, this is Yogesh. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. Uh, just small question that uh, this, uh, this uh, vector of fluctuations, I mean, supposing we like in vacuum, if we try to sort of calculate the uh, energy due to these fluctuations, uh, will it be positive or negative? In... So that is a good question. I do not actually know uh, how to compute the zero point energy of these fluctuations. So okay. the argument is more indirect. What is happening is that if you say that if you want to find out what scale the vacuum energy will have, so you start from first principle. Suppose you say you add all the virtual fluctuations and they're giving you Planck scale positive. Suppose you assume that. Then the universe will have Planck scale positive curvature. But then you cannot form the virtual fluctuations bigger than Planck scale because the black hole, a black hole of radius R needs at least, you know, the horizon to be bigger than radius R to form. Yeah. So then you find that these virtual fluctuations don't exist. So the energy becomes even higher because virtual fluctuations, they can form, they like lower the energy, right? Because that's the natural progression of the wave function. So you cannot actually find the energy of the vacuum without thinking about what the vacuum energy is, then that creates some curvature, that creates these virtual vectors, and then the energy of the vectors feeds back into what the energy of the thing is. 
So you have to solve the entire energy self energy of the vacuum self consistently after taking into account what vacuoles can formulate. Okay. So no, you cannot actually say let's compute the energy of the vacuoles by some calculation. No, one reason I was thinking was that okay, because I mean you mentioned that okay initially it's like okay when something is collapsing, like okay sort of these singularity theorems okay. they say that okay if something is collapsing these light cones tilt and then okay you like okay but like okay they all assume that okay you have all the everything has positive energy then this yeah. happens but if these uh, vector fluctuations okay they somehow have to circumvent this and uh, yeah. the ratio you showed that okay instead of like okay uh, uh, just uh, collapsing like this okay first balls form yeah. so if like okay can this that okay they have some sort of negative energy and that leads to the loophole to the singularity theorems so uh i am not sure if i can definitely write something as negative energy because the problem that is happening is that when the vectors are on the scale at which you are working right you are working at a curvature radius of 3 km and the vector they talk about outside 3 km hmm. so you cannot then divide that to make a good idea of energy density because the energy density is a local thing right so you have to take the total energy and divide by the volume but only if it is like if you have lots of little vectors you can average over them but if you're talking of vectors of 3 km size and also in a region only of 3 km you can't define energy density but so something like say stress tensor uh, uh, that is can be defined at each point some your so i think that is the kind of thing which i would love to explore i don't understand that very well if you can define a stress tensor that is fine as an operator you can define it but if the fluctuations in t are comparable to the value of t then it doesn't actually help so huh. what is actually happening is that when you try to form the black hole horizon some vectors stretch some vectors uh, cost too much energy and the entire wave functional over the space of vectors changes now whether you so the whole wave function over vectors is the complete wave functional of m because now you have everything in front of you right all the virtual properties of all sizes their probabilities are in this wave functional so up to there you have now how to filter that out into some effective energy i would be very happy if that could be done if that could be done as an effective local negative energy it would be beautiful but i have not done that but if people can explore that i would be very happy and one uh, related question that okay uh, ultimately like okay the vector fluctuations i mean for the cosmological case i mean uh, do you have some thoughts on whether okay the initial singularity is resolved in some way or uh, we can't say till now so i have not tried to understand the initial singularity or like what happens before the big bang kind of questions but i think the answers to all those have to be obtained as some kind of a limit of what we are seeing at these other times right so once this vector comes in then what we are seeing is that there is some structure to space time which tells you how far one point is coherent with the other point normally we think of every point as different from every point because there is only planck length structure around every point but now we are seeing that's not everything there's planck length fluctuation but there's also the virtual vectors of radii up to something and hmm. that's what really glues space one piece of space to some other piece of space the virtual fluctuations are different places that's what is giving a structure of space time so as we go towards the big bang the size of this virtual fluctuation on each point is becoming less so there's less of a glue between different points so in that sense all the points are becoming more individual rather than being glued into a manifold so the whole idea of what is happening at the big bang has to change because the way the question is being asked is different it's not just a manifold which is becoming you know squeezed or stretched in the manifold the virtual fluctuation around a point tell you how much that point is connected to the neighboring points by these large vector things and that is changing so the whole manifold structure is changing in some way so i think all the questions have become more deeper and different questions okay but the important the point is that okay for everything we have to include these vector fluctuations that is the I, main yes. take home idea that is the main point i am making i don't know that much about them or what they will do or how to get an effective theory of them and those are exactly the kind of questions people should think about in my opinion but i think from the black hole information paradox i think one can absolutely and rigorously prove that you need the vector picture because as i was saying the small corrections will not help because mm. of small correction theorem and then 
how to get something at the horizon scale. Uh, if there's no virtual fluctuation there, the equivalence principle is still true. Hmm. So if the equivalence principle is true and locally you can just come in, then if you have causality, there's no way you can get out of the horizon. Hmm. So okay. it's such a airtight argument. That's why nobody could solve the puzzle for all these years. That if you have no extended structure anywhere in the system, then there is really no way of solving. That argument can be made completely rigorous. So because of that, I think the vectors have to be there of all radii. Because if you say they're only up to, let's say, one meter, then the black hole of size three, three kilometers, that is in trouble. So they have to be of all sizes in Minkowski space. In the cosmology, they can, don't have to be of all sizes because you cannot make a black hole larger than the cosmological horizon. And then you see when you try to make them, they cannot be bigger than the Hubble constant, than the particle horizon because of causality. So a whole new dynamic starts in the cosmology. But in flat space, that they must be there to all different radii. I think the black hole paradox just nails it completely. Thanks a lot. A very thought-provoking talk. Thank you. Thank you, Yogesh, for your questions. Uh, do you have other questions from the students, Nilesh? Sir, I have a question. Uh, please, please ask. Sir, uh, when you have divided the bigger black holes and uh, like uh, many smaller black holes, so what will be the effect on the entropy as to if the black holes, smaller black holes were entangled with each other? So let me see if I can go back to that picture. Uh, you're talking about this kind of where did I draw that? this kind of picture, right? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. So yes, it doesn't matter whether you entangle them or not. Right now, I was just counting the entropy, which is the number of states they can have. And in general, yes, you are welcome to entangle them. But whether they are entangled with each other or not entangled with each other, that depends on how they form, right? Because if this part of the universe has not had time to talk to this part, then they are not entangled. If this type part of the universe has had time to talk to this part, then they are entangled. So usually they will only entangle with their immediate neighbors. Right? So usually they'll just have local entanglement and that is the way it is in uh, something which is forming in cosmology. Like if you have some local radiation in one region of cosmology, it is entangled with the local radiation in the immediate neighborhood, but not with radiation very far away. While if you are looking at a you know, static situation like a big box, which I've been standing for a long time without expanding, then any photon in one corner can be entangled with the photon in the other corner. So that way the entanglement is there and it can be there, but usually it will be only with the neighboring guys because the universe has not had time to communicate with faraway guys. But uh, this entropy argument and the equation of state, that doesn't care about whether they are entangled or not. It only cares about how many states we have here. Does it answer your question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, any questions from uh, Patko? Patko, do you have any question? No, sir. Shomo, do you have any question? No, sir. Obisek? No, sir. So, but like one, uh, sir, I would like to one ask one question, like the argument which you made that black holes should not combine with one another, the argument you made using was that wo the volume, there's not uh, much volume there, enough volume there for so that they cannot combine. But like, uh, is it possible, like, uh, suppose uh, uh, the entropy comes out of out as a radiation, like a leftover entropy, and you can have a volume, which the the back hole of that volume which fits inside the box. Okay, so I think what you're saying is that if these guys want to combine, right now if they combine mm -hmm. to one big black hole, then one can see it needs much more volume because the radius of that will be more. But suppose yes. some of the energy goes into radiation, that can yes. float between the black holes. So there can be one big black hole here and some little radiation here. So these guys yes. can go into one black hole plus radiation. So that you can do in principle. I mean, the energy is balanced, but the entropy is much lower. So even this, you can bring it here, right? So the, yes, the entropy will be much lower. So if I take the black hole plus radiation, the radiation entropy is much lower than the black hole entropy. So right now we were only trying to see what the maximum entropy we can put in the box. That way I can only put only the radiation, right? That's also a possibility, but it has even lower entropy. So for any given energy, I can consider the phase where I only have radiation. The only thing is that doesn't have as much entropy as maybe making a black hole. Or the, that doesn't have as much entropy as making a bigger black hole, and this one has even more. Okay, sir. So they will not try to go to the yes, phase sir. where there's one black hole plus radiation. If, if they want to go there, the entropy has to decrease. 
So because that topic cannot go. Okay, okay. 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 Th thank you very much, sir. So I think there is no further question. Uh, is there is any other people wants to ask question? Please ask because it is already two hours. I don't want to <laughs> give more trouble to Sami because it's long talk. And uh, it's good that people discusses and ask a lot of questions. That's very important. And I would suggest Sami to send the uh, slides so that I can uh, send to the others. And you can ask questions and discuss by sending email to him. And uh, last, last but not the least, thank you again for uh, giving this contribution for this forum. And stay safe and healthy. Uh, that's very important. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Okay. Thank you to everybody. Thanks for your interest. Thank you, sir. Bye -bye. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I would like to talk to you tomorrow at what time I can call you. So we can call talk anytime tomorrow is Friday. Yeah. Uh, what time you will be free? I need to talk to you something. I will check and let you know because Friday I may have some thesis come defense. No, no, whatever if, you do. If weekend is okay, I can talk yeah. weekend also. Yeah, okay. I will send, I will send you. Yeah. yeah. I have some thesis defense in the summer, various days. And also send me Sumit's number. No, I told him, I told him already. Okay. So I will send you phone number. It may also be same as WhatsApp, but uh, yeah. at least phone number I have. Yeah. Yeah. So possibly WhatsApp, but otherwise, because phone number calling means I need international calling facility in my phone, but WhatsApp is okay with me. So, okay. but but give me number. I will contact him and try and see if it works. Okay. Okay. I will yeah. do that. And then whenever you are free, if not uh, tomorrow, then over the weekend, you can. Yeah. Uh, I will talk. Just let okay. me know whenever is the right time. But at yeah. least half an hour we need to talk. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So is father okay now? Everything yeah. okay in uh, Delhi? Yeah, yeah. Things okay. are okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we'll talk okay. next time. Okay. 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 Thanks to everybody. Thank you for this talk. I take Bye -bye. the liberty of talking to you at any time, and I, I dare to ask many things and uh, discuss this thing which does not happen in when other people are said talking, but uh, this is. So well, that's good part actually. You guys are asking questions. This is yeah. discussion is important. If somebody is just only speaking, that that would be also not be very good for him. Also. Yes, yes. Nobody is very nice. It was very nice. Thank you. Okay, Samir, thank you very much. Okay. Smita, etc. are fine. Children? Yes, yes. Everybody is good. Okay. Yes. Okay. We we'll talk about the weekend whenever you are free. Yeah. Okay. Okay.